Oops. <laughs> What's up, people? Okay, we're trying Instagram again today. So you guys let me know if the sound sounds funky again. And then I'll just have to, we'll wait another month or two till they get the technology down a little bit better. So you guys, I'm going to keep an eye on the chat. Let me know if there's lagging or weirdness uh, on YouTube. And then we'll just have to drop... Um, yeah, I'm going to do another one, uh, probably May, April, May, something like that. Uh, but I'll start, you know, I'll start letting people know about it, like the end of March. So people have plenty of time to get signed up. So how is the sound so far? Is it okay? Are you getting, experiencing lagging? Keep me informed about what's happening. So you guys all in here socializing and whatnot, just ignoring me. That's okay. It's good. All right. Well, maybe they fixed whatever was. Because remember, we tried it when it first came out, and that was a disaster. That did not work at all. So I had to turn it off. Sounds good. Okay. Well, then let us proceed. Well, welcome to What the Fuck Whenever. That's some I forgot who suggested that name because, you know, it just, whenever it happens, it's once a week, though. It's just, I don't know what day it's going to happen. It's just once a week. Okay. So there you go. That's the best I can offer you. So um, what's going on here? Why did that happen? That was weird. Um, we have our 25 questions as usual. What we do on this show is people send in their questions in advance. They go into this document. When it's emailed to me, I print it out. It has a cover sheet. So I don't see any of the questions. And then I read them and I give an answer off the top of my big head. Also, if you wrote in this, you know, you got an email from Candace that your letter is going to be in this week. Be sure to check out and listen to not only to what I say, but also check the uh, chat over here on YouTube because the very loyal squad will have some very good answers for you that augment mine. OK. Sometimes we get new people and they say crazy stuff, but for the most part, it's, you know, it's pretty cool. What's up, everybody? Let's get started because this looks like this. When it's thick like this, that means the questions are long. That's what that means. Okay, so this is a young lady in the 20 to 34 age group from the UK. Some of the issue. My boyfriend left me while I was helping my family in the hospital. Wow, he's trifling. Last week, my father was taken into the hospital. He's had early dementia for two years. Hospital says he has an infection that has spread critically to his heart. We have since been called to say goodbye in the middle of the night. But two days later, he's still hanging on. He said Zayed for now to give his body a break. We've been taking turns as a family sitting with him. It's tiring, but we're looking after each other. The past few days, my boyfriend of almost two years has been acting off. I was messaging him about random life and telling him that I need a distraction, but he was cold. I dragged it out of him that he's been talking to his friends about how he wants to leave me. Wow. While her dad is dying in the hospital, he comes. Well, I don't even know what to say. He said it's, quote, too much for him right now. I was really hurt. He spoke to his friends rather than being up front with me. We're in our early 30s. We're not kids. It was I was so upset. I rang him 
in floods of tears. He cried too. I then asked him, would he stay in mine last night as I didn't want to be alone if I got a bad call during the night? But he said he needed to mind his head and that it wouldn't be good to share a space. I've stopped replying to him and he's sending messages. I am so lost, Deb. I have been sitting in the ICU trying to concentrate on my family and now I'm distracted by him. His, his dad had a heart attack last year and I was there for his whole family. I know if I tell my family, they will be very angry on my behalf and I'm not ready for that yet. I have two schools of thought on this. One is, you know, it's good that you found out now, right? While you're still healthy and young and you can go and find someone else. It's not at a point where you're the one in the hospital and he decides to leave you. That's what a lot of these dudes do. They can't handle it. So you found out that he's not, you know, he's on, he's a good time kind of fair weather friend type of dude. And you, you know, he's, he, the trash took yourself out essentially. <clears throat> the other side of me, even though you were there for him and even though most people feel like, well, you know, I'm in this relationship. I want to support my, my beloved and all this whole stuff here. <clears throat> the bottom line is you're not married. I have to keep bringing this up. And everybody just doesn't get it. When you're not married, it's hard to have those kind of, I mean, it's really inappropriate to have those kind of expectations of a mere boyfriend or girlfriend. That's family matters. They're not in your family. Okay. So your family should be supporting each other as you guys are doing with no regard or involvement from him. As harsh as that may sound, it is the fact. Okay. Boyfriends and girlfriends are not husbands and wives. I don't care how long you've been with them. How many babies you done had with them? How many years you done lived with them? How many dogs you bought with them? All the trips you went on with them. It doesn't matter. That's not your husband and you're not his wife. So he is really under no obligation to support you through this. Do you feel me? I Like I said, I know it's going to be, you know, people are going to be like sitting there with their mouths in the Pikachu face like, oh, how can she say that? My boyfriend, my boyfriend. Boyfriends ain't shit. I keep telling y'all that. Boyfriends don't mean nothing. You can't get a tax deduction with a boyfriend. You don't get good credit with a boyfriend. You don't get any money in your bank account with a boyfriend. You don't get a promotion at your job with a boyfriend. All boyfriends are there for is nook nook. That's it. And somebody to talk to. If you have friends, you have somebody to talk to and you can get nook nook from anybody. So there's really no point in having a boyfriend if you're not headed to down the aisle. Okay? There's no point. You're just tying yourself up and keeping yourself off the market from meeting Mr. Wonderful being tied up with a knucklehead like you did for two years. You see what I'm saying? You girls have been getting these relationships and just like, man, I, I, I no boyfriends for me. When I was young, mm -mm, I didn't want one. I had fun. I told you all my friend was a flight attendant for Continental Airlines. We went everywhere. We went everywhere. And I did everything I wanted to do, plus some for you. Because I was single and I made sure I stayed single and I didn't want anybody having any expectations of me because I wasn't going to meet them. You know. Um, I can't, Phoenix, you have to send that in an email. When I'm doing the show, I don't answer other questions. I only answer these. Sorry, but just send an email to survivingdating at gmail.com and ask whatever you want to ask. So that's where you're making your mistake. OK, you're having like husband expectations of a raggedy ass boyfriend. <laughs> and as you see, he ain't about shit and there's no point in you continuing to cry about him because he's stupid. You know, I mean, even if a, as a friend, he could at least, you know, talk to you on the phone and be supportive in some kind of way. I mean, not necessarily the way that you want him to be, but some kind of way, you know what I mean? Go to the hospital with you something. And especially if he knew your dad, say hello to your family, bring some flowers, or bring some food or fruit or cake, something. He could do a little something, but he opted, you know, completely out. But like I said, that's really OK. We can't charge him with a crime for that. Now, what I want you to do is go on your phone. And I want you to block his number. Anybody that's his friend or family's number that's in your phone, I want you to block it. Mistake you guys make. And I did a, it's, it's a short on the channel about this. You make a break up with these relationships and you don't you don't ever block the dude. So you keep the door open for him to continue to disturb your life and, you know, bother you with bullshit. And you just, I don't know what the resistance is to blocking fools. Every so many months I go through my phone and block people just because I'm like, I don't even know who this is anymore. Block. I don't like to delete it because then 
They might creep through, so I block it. Oh, this poor child. Let's move on to question number two. This is a female in the 22 to 27 age group. We got 25 questions. This is question number two. So go out and tell your friends. You can post a link on your social media and get more people over here for Saturday Night Funsies. She's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Summary of issue. Is dating always an exciting event, even later in life? Does the excitement from dating fade with age? Dating was never exciting. I don't know what you've been smoking. I am 25 and got back into the dating scene recently. Some bad dates and a couple of good ones. The person I'm seeing casually now is very nice and I think it's going well. But I don't feel excited like I remember feeling when I first started dating my first couple of partners. Maybe it's me that just got jaded with bad experiences. Deb, what's your thoughts on a more relaxing start instead of endless butterflies? The endless butterflies is something that stupid little teenage girls get. Now that you're 25, you're not a stupid teenage girl anymore. That's why you don't have that. You have life experience now. You're out of school. You got a job. You pay bills. You vote. There are all kinds of responsibilities that you didn't have when you was running around getting butterflies. Okay? Butterflies don't mean anything. Like, if it meant something, where are them clowns now? Right? Why didn't that last if it butterflies was so, so hot and wonderful? They don't mean shit. It's just something because butterflies are connected with a lot of fantasy. And young girls who have no dating experience and no real experience with men tend to, you know, put them on a pedestal and think that it's magical, wonderful, and all Disney-like and all this old stuff here. And so when you find out that men are stupid and they make stupid mistakes and they say dumb things and they, you know, are just retarded sometimes, then you, you you realize that, you know, this was really nothing to be excited about. And then that's when you approach real relationships realistically. Right, ladies? Because you know they're going to say something stupid. They're going to do something stupid. They're going to disappoint you in some very critical way. It's, it's always something. You just basically just sitting there waiting for the other shoe to drop. That's essentially what, what relationships are these days. And sometimes, you know, it's like even if you've been married to him for a long time, the shoe will still drop. I don't want she was married for 25 years. She was bragging about how her husband never cheated and he never did all the stuff. Right? She was always excited about how wonderful their marriage were. Who came home to announce that he was their paycheck was getting garnished for child support for a baby he made with some bitch? And she was devastated. And I said, oh, they're going to, I could hear it now. That shoe just dropped. You see what I mean? It's so, it's just, you know, whether he dropped the shoe drops in a week, a month, a couple of years, or a couple of decades, it never fucking fails. The shoe drops. Sometimes it's just, you know, like a slipper and you can just, you know, pick it up and keep it moving. But, you know, what's she going to do with him with a whole side kid and getting tapped, you know, his money getting sucked away? Stupid, just stupid. It's like, and then he, you know, exposed her to disease because for the woman to get pregnant, that means he wasn't strapping up right, right? So he was just out there just playing Russian roulette and putting his right wife's health at risk. Just trifling, just stupid. I just don't know. Yeah, I think butterflies is, I think I had butterflies once and I was about 12. <laughs> and I liked this little boy. He lived in the neighborhood. He was 14. And I thought he was just the cat's meow. But, you know, my brothers put an end to that. <laughs> He's like, you ain't liking nobody until you get out of college. And I was like, oh, is that what's happening here? So that was the end of that. That lasted all of one day. But, yeah, I think I had butterflies. Okay, let's move on to question number three. And only way to finish answering your question, no, it never gets easy. And it is better when you have a calm and rational mind. When you're dating, because then you make decisions logically. You can still feel feelings, but you analyze your feelings and you make sure that they make sense. That's the benefit to having life experience and being older. Question number three, female, 22 to 27 from Germantown, Maryland. Ooh, I wonder where that is. Summary of issue, YouTube is ruining my life. I'm 23 and I've watched YouTube since I was 11. Some YouTubers I still watch to this day. However, recently I've come to the realization that it might be the cause of a lot of my mental health problems. Oh, I've been saying that. I've been saying that I think that's the core of why all these young people have anxiety and depression and uh, low self-esteem. I, I, it, it all came with the onset of, you know, social media, not so much with AOL. But once people's social media started, what was that first platform? Uh, shoot, I can't remember. 
And then Facebook came and it was just downhill from there. Uh, okay. I haven't had friends since graduating from high school and I have such high social anxiety. See, just a Snapchat notification will have my heart racing. So I keep all social media notifications off so I don't see it. I'd just rather spend my time watching other people live their lives. I didn't realize how much it fulfills my any sort of loneliness I have in that moment, but it doesn't allow me to feel real loneliness and see happiness from people in my real life. Now, don't get me wrong. I do have my days of feeling sad and lonely and wishing I had a friend to do something as simple as go to the grocery store with or grab a quick bite to eat. I also live in the heart of a major college town. So some Friday nights, I wish I was at a bar or club with a group of friends. But guess what? I do instead of reaching out to someone because, you know, that's just too stressful for me. I guess you guessed it. I watch YouTube. Like I said, some of these people kept I've kept up with since I was a kid. I've watched a lot of these people grow from nothing and I feel sad when they don't post for a while. Tonight I had a bit of a breakdown and I feel life has gotten too bad. I feel like I don't even know how to socialize properly with someone my age and I'm scared that it'll never get out of this constant cycle. I know I need professional help and I'm working on seeking that out. I guess in the meantime, I just like any advice. How do I just cut off watching YouTube when it feels like I'm breaking up with all these people who's always giving me joy and happiness? It feels so dumb to even write or say that out loud. Um, <laughs> you have to realize something. You know, other than the people here that I've actually met offline and, and in real life or talked to on the phone or something like that. Um, if I passed them in the street, I wouldn't know who they were. They might recognize me because they see me, but I don't see them. So I don't know who, you know, what they look like and who they are and all that stuff. And the same thing would go for you. So these people that you follow online, I mean, you say you feel like you're breaking up with them, but is that, will they even know that you're not there? I mean, my channel you know, only has like 30,000 subscribers That's compared to some that have like a million and stuff. How are we supposed to keep up with who hasn't shown up lately and who has? Should I barely remember my doctor's appointments and stuff? You think I would be remembering the 30,000 people's names? That's not going to happen, son. Never will that happen. 30 maybe, but not 30,000. So it's, it's a kind of interesting um, perspective that you have. It's a little unrealistic. And I think, like I said, um, this anxiety that you kids feel, you bring that on yourself because of your unrealistic expectations. No, if you don't go on people's YouTube channel, same with me. I mean, I might miss you when I, by the time I see you, you say, oh, I'm back. I'll be like thinking like, oh, yeah, I haven't seen so-and-so for a while. Where you been? You know, that kind of thing. But in general, it's not the kind of thing where we're going to sit there and scroll through the list and check names like a teacher and talk, call and roll and see who's not around. So they're not going to miss you. That's my, to say, I'm saying all this stuff to come to that conclusion. They're not going to miss you if you don't watch them. Don't feel like it's a breakup. It's nothing personal. Especially, like I said, if you follow them big channels with, you know, 150,000, 200, 300, 400,000 subscribers, they show sure ain't going to miss you. So I'm thinking, you know, getting some professional help for yourself would be good and trying to get into some clubs or something, maybe at your university, some, something that you're interested in, you know, like photography, uh, writing, sports or some kind of maybe soccer or something, tennis. I mean, what I don't know what your university offers, but, you know, look around at the, at the different extracurricular activities and see what interests you and then go and join one or two of them and start socializing with people. It's a skill set that you're going to need to have when you get out of school. It's unrealistic to think that you're going to go into the workforce and be able to just sit there like a bump on a log and not talk to people and not socialize with your coworkers and your uh, supervisors and stuff. That's not going to work. So you better start developing that skill now. Yeah, these kids, they're just weird. I told you all about that dinner I did. I took myself out for my birthday. It was a couple of years ago. And I went to Scott's. That's when I could still eat shrimp. <laughs> I went to Scott's Seafood, right? I'm having some shrimp something. And so I'm sitting at this two-spot table, and there's the, they had a live band playing. It was really good, like a little quartet. And then on the other side of the divider, to me, were six top tables. And uh, this group of, you know, young adults came in. And every single one of them, um, let me see. They sat down and they mumbled a few words to each other and then just pretend like this is my phone. Okay, this 
flash the no, thumb drive. This is my phone, right? So I'm holding my phone. And so you could see from when I, I, none of them were facing each other. All they had their heads down and were laughing by themselves at something on the screens. Six of them. There was not a word of conversation at that entire table. And I, it was just, it was shocking to me because I had never seen anything like that. I mean, usually you see a group of young people, they just so excited and talking about everything. And there's three or four conversations going at the same time. And people are laughing and screaming and play fighting across the table and, you know, talking about each other, throwing little, little jabs and stuff. It was be fun to be an environment of excitement. They could have been at a funeral for all, you know, the conversation that was happening. It was, it was terrible. So young people that, you know, developing those kinds of social abilities, you got to stay on top of that. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, you, you do get, I mean, humans need human contact. They can't interact like that. What does DJ say to me? Hmm. Well, I'll look at that later after the show. Yeah, I just don't get it. And then they go on the date to try to find a date and they're using the swipey things. So, you know, there's no real interaction there. They just, yeah, I like you. I like you. I like, oh, I don't like you. Oh, she's cool. She's cool. She's, oh, no, you're ugly. You know, and it's without even a word of conversation with the person. I don't, I don't get this new lifestyle. It's going to be a whole bunch of mentally ill, lonely ass people when these this group now gets to be old. They're going to have no social skills, no social interactions, and just be very just weird because of the fact that they're so isolated. They're isolating themselves. Whereas the seniors now are getting isolated because, you know, their friends and are dying off and, you know, they family might be far away or whatever, and they're just by themselves. It's different. These, these people are choosing to be isolated, even in the same room with a room full of folks. They're still isolating themselves. It's just bizarre. Let's move on to question number four. This is a young lady in the 20 to 34 age group from the greater London area. It says, summary of issue. How to tell my friend that I can't pick her up and send her back all the time. My friend and I, were both 30, attend a pottery workshop every weekend. I drive and she doesn't. She has anxiety issues. See? She would like me to pick her up and send her back every time. The drive to her place is a 15-minute detour, and picking her up and sending her back would add around 20 kilometers, 29 kilometers to my drive. She's quite a nice person, offers me gas money, but the drive and time I have to allocate tires me out, not to mention the planning of my day around the commute. Weekends are when I spend my, my me time, and sometimes I'd like to go somewhere else after the workshop to which she'd offer to tag along, and I could send her back after. I like the option of getting to drop by the workshop whenever I can, which I can't if I'm having a detour to detour or set a pickup time. She's not too familiar with public transport slash car ride services and is of the opinion that they're too expensive. Fair enough. The fares can get a bit high. There's a train station near me. I'm thinking of asking her to take the train so I can just pick her up from there. But that would mean her spending more money or getting her aging dad to send her to the station. Am I being too insensitive over this? Since my reasons are not really urgent and she is a good longtime friend, yeah, that chick gets tiresome. And people think, you know, your, your, your ass is a chauffeur? No. I mean, it's one thing if you offer. Are you guys, you know, when you guys sign up for the class, you you agreed that that was what you were going to do and she would give you so much per week and gas money. But it doesn't sound like that was the agreement. She just like has this expectation. So what you're going to do is tell her, you know, it's, it's, too ex it's too exhausting for me to pick you up and drive you off all the time. So what you're going to be doing is taking a train to this whatever station, XYZ station. I'll pick you up from there and then I'll drop you off from there or some other train station. And then you can get find your way home because I have things I want to do with other people after the workshops or, or run errands or whatever. And I don't necessarily want company. It's my me time. And I'd like to be able to free, be the, free, have the freedom to do that. And then she's going to look sad and she'll be upset. But guess what? She'll get over it. So it's like either you're going to do it this way or you're not going to go to the pottery workshop or you're going to get there the best way you can. Either way, I, I mean, but this me chauffeuring you stuff, this is this, this shit is over. It's not happening no more. That's all you have to say. And if she has a problem with it, then say, well, I don't know what to tell you. Then you're going to get to the pottery workshop the best way you can because I'm not going to be driving out there and picking you up and taking you back anymore. 
I've, that I, I've made that decision. That's over. She'll get over it. I don't know how people can expect that. You know, I don't know how much, how long, how many miles is 29 kilometers? What's that translate to miles? She said it's a 15 minute detour, but that doesn't mean it's, to, it's through the streets on the freeway, some expressway or something. You know, she doesn't really clarify. But miles don't lie, kilometers or miles, whatever. Anybody know? You know I'm nosy. I want to know how long, how, how many miles is 29 kilometers? Guess nobody knows. I'm sad. <laughs> okay, let's do question number five then. Summer of issue. Oh, this is a young man in the 22 to 27 age group from the UK also. Summer of issue. My girlfriend accused me of stringing her along when I actually changed my mind about wanting children. When my girlfriend and I got together, one of the initial things we discussed was children. We both wanted two kids in the future. We said that we'd likely start a family when she's in her early 30s. She was 22 when we talked about this and is 24 now and I'm 27 now. Early 30s, that's a long way away. Since then, we've been on a few holidays abroad and there's a long list of places we want to visit and there's a lot I want to experience in life. Obviously, with work and money, we can't really do a lot of it each year. We're managing between one and two trips abroad each year we live in the UK, I know. Recently, I've been thinking about everything we said we want to do and experience and to tick everything off the list, it will take a long time. Having children will massively hinder that as we'll obviously have a lot less free time. And when the children start to get older, our holidays will end up being more family focused. That doesn't seem as appealing to me as it did originally. And I'd rather go down the list of places I want to visit and see as much of the world as possible. I told my girlfriend I wanted to talk and she asked what it was about. I told her I no longer wanted children and told her that the reasons mentioned above. She asked if I was sure, and I said, well, I'm not 100% certain, I'm pretty sure. She then asked what it meant for us, and I said that obviously I'd love to do everything together, but I know she wants children, so it might mean the end for us. She accused me of stringing her along and, living, and lying to her from the start about wanting children and trying to pressure her to stay and give up on the idea of having children, which isn't true. She just kept repeating that I had been stringing her along and expecting her to give up on wanting children. How do you assess that I handle this? You make it clear, you make it three sentence. You say, number one, it's 29 kilometers. Yeah, how many is that in miles? Oh, 18 miles, okay, thank you. Oh, that's not too far, but still do I have to do it. I mean, is that each way? That's probably, might be each way, I don't know. But anyway, okay, moving on back to this letter. Um. What you, what you have to tell her is, you know, when we talked about that, we were 22 and young and dumb. Now that I'm older and now I really have a better handle on the responsibility and obligations of parenting, it's something that I want to put off for at least another 10 or 15 years. I'm not interested in doing it. I want to do all this stuff first as a single man. Now, if that's a problem for you, because I changed my mind as I matured and grew up, then, you know, you're not leaving me any room to grow and change. You want me to stay the same as I was when, I, when we first met when, you know, I was 22 years old. I'm never going to be that person again. That person is gone. So either you roll with this person that I am now or you can just, you know, you can leave because I'm not having no kids. And I suggest, sir, that you watch it. If you sleep, still want to be sleeping with her, you better protect yourself real good because this will be an instant way for her to make you be a father. Don't be stupid. I mean, you would have had a participation in it too, don't get me wrong, but I'm just telling you now, be aware of the fact that this is a high risk situation for you right now. So if I were you, I wouldn't be sleeping with her anymore and I would probably break up. That's what I would do. If she's that fixed on having kids and she's only 24. Wait, is she 22? Wait, who's 20? Are you, I forgot. Let me see. Hold on a second before I start lying. Oh, he's 27 now and she's 24 now. I see. So he was 25 when he said that. Like I said last week, the 20s is when you grow and change to figure out who you are. And it's never a good idea to be, you know, married or in some long term type of relationship like that. 
at that age. It's just, you change too much. You still don't even know who the hell you are at 22, 24 years old. This is just sad, but she's just focused on having a bunch of kids and stuff. She should be thinking about something else with her life that's far more, more important than breeding. Poor thing. Question number six. This is a male in the 28 to 34 age group from Caldwell, Idaho. Summer of issue. I am very inexperienced and need advice on how to respond to women approaching me. What should I do? To start, I found you on Twitch. I am a 29-year-old white guy with very little experience with women. For most of my life, I was very overweight and did not really take care of myself. But last summer, I sort of woke up and began going to the gym, dressing nicely and working to improve myself. I have been really happy with my overall progress. And in the last few months, I've noticed that I'm gaining a bit of attention from women around me. Usually I'm oblivious, but even I have noticed women checking me out at the gym or the grocery store. And on occasion, a cashier will flirt with me or a stranger will approach me and strike up a conversation. Oh, you're getting some, you're getting some play. That's what we call it. I have a long way to go still on my fitness goal, but even my sister has commented on other women looking at me when we go shopping. I'm flattered by the tension, but I don't really know what to do with it. How can I respond to their interest and how can I politely decline should I need to? Thanks for reading. Well, if you, um, you know, you're out and you see the women are interested in you and you look at her and you check around and she's of interest back, you know, you're interested back, then you just walk your little legs over there and say, hi, you like what you're looking at? And she's going to blush and be like, oh, he and then you say, let me get them digits. But, you know, use your words. But basically, it's like, you know, I'd like to call, you know, like to get to know you. So how about, you know, we exchange numbers and, you know, I'll call you and we can set up a date. And then she'll be like, OK. And then she'll give you her number and then you walk away. You say, OK, I'll call you later. Oh, it's that simple, my brother. Now, at the gym, um, you know, just because a girl's looking at you, that doesn't mean she wants to you know, get with you or something. She could just be looking because she's noticing the change. Like I me, mean, when I look at the guys at the gym, I'm not interested in them whatsoever. I'm just, I'm looking at it with my ex trainer eye. Like, oh, you know, he's got some good chest belt. He needs to work on his back some more. I look at him a little late. He's just working on his upper body and he looked like he's going to fall over like Johnny Rocket. You know, just up them little Tweedledee legs and a big top part. And it's like, he's not, his frame is unbalanced. He needs to work on his glutes. Look at this saggy booty and stuff like that. I mean, those are the thoughts going through my mind. But they, since I'm looking at them, they might think, oh, she's, you know, she's checking me out. But <laughs> I am checking them out, but not that way. Not like that. So it's kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, I'll be talking about them. Like, oh, look at his legs. Like the little Asian dudes, they coming in with these little tight shorts on. And they had them little muscular legs. And I'd be like, oh, what's going on here? What's your name, sir? <laughs> I like I like men to have muscles. It looks nice. So, you know, you keep doing what you're doing, but, then, you know, start. The main thing is if you look at her and you're interested, then you can do something about it. Or if she comes up to you and she's of interest, then you do something about it. If you're not interested, then you don't do anything. You just, you know, say hello and it was, well, it's good to meet you. I need to get going or something along those lines. And you break off the conversation. But if you, you know, she walks up to you and you're like, oh, she's cute. I want to get to know her. She's, you know, she's funny and, you know, I love her smile, something along those lines. Then you say, if she's trying to talk to you, then you say, well, I know I'm busy in the middle of my work right now, but how about we change the numbers? And then you know, we can get together after or, you know, tomorrow or something. Okay, that's how you do it, sir. It's not hard. That's what I'm saying. I'd be, yeah, exactly. I'd be critiquing. You're exactly right. And looking at people's form. Some of them folks don't know what the hell they're doing. They be waving the weights around. It's just awful. It's like you're not using your back muscles at all. They be using their arms, like sawing the weight instead of engaging their back to pull the weight. It's funny. I'd be tempted to go over there, but I'm saying, no, nah, I'm not getting paid. Shut up. Question number seven. This is a female in the 20 to 34 age group from Charleston, South Carolina. Summer issue. Can I ask to no longer be the maid of honor in a wedding? Absolutely. Deb, a couple of months ago, a friend asked me to be her maid of honor. I was honored. She's getting married in a couple of months and I'm so scared for, I'm excited for her. <laughs> I'm scared for her. We have been friends for three-ish years and I was very surprised to be selected for this role as I didn't realize our friendship was that level to her. Upon taking on this responsibility, I realized she was extremely behind on everything wedding related. 
She wanted a dress from a specific designer and the designer takes 10 months to create the dress. So I basically had to beg and drag my friend to take this seriously or else she wouldn't be able to get her dream dress in time. The lady at the store alluded to the fact that she may not even have time to get it altered, but assured me that she would get it in time and thank me for taking it so seriously. She refuses to pick a location or date for her bachelorette party and all the other women in the bridal party are getting stressed out as we all have busy schedules. She's been trying to pick out bridesmaids dresses and keeps on selecting extremely revealing dresses that I and the other women honestly don't feel comfortable in. I have sent 12 plus beautiful dresses in the color she wants, but she refuses to select anything. I've been taking on a lot trying to help her to help along with the emotional labor, trying to support her with other things and requiring nothing in return. But a week ago, she completely forgot my birthday and hasn't mentioned it despite it being all over social media. And I just feel so exhausted and resentful. Would it be rude to ask to no longer be the maid of honor or express that if she won't make decisions about the bachelorette, the rest of us won't be able to make time for it? Deb, my advice, any advice on handling this situation assertively that can still preserve the friendship would be appreciated. Well, like I said, you said in the beginning that you didn't really think you guys were that level of friend anyway. So, you know, why are you going through all these changes? So what you have to do is say, look, over the cat time you, since I agreed to be your maid of honor, you've been nothing but uh, a pain in the ass. I was trying to look for a polite word to say, because you said you want, you know, you want to preserve the friendship, but I wouldn't be too worried about that right about now. And I said, you've been a pain in the ass. You don't make any decisions about anything. You know, the whole thing is going to be a, a disaster. And what I'm going to do right now is bow out from this role. So you need to find somebody else to be your maid of honor. I'm not going to do it. I'll just be a guest at the wedding or something if I even do that. Because you are ridiculous. And I just, I don't have the time for this. I had the time. Can't do it. That's what you say. I don't understand why you have so worried about not hurting her feelings. She sure ain't worried about not hurting yours. I see no evidence of that. So, you know. Nobody, you right, nobody else would do it. <laughs> and so she was all flattered and stuff. I was supposed to be, a, I got asked to be a maid of honor and my daughter was going to be the flower girl. And then I started realizing how much it was going to cost. I quickly bowed out of that shit. She wanted to have this dress that cost $300 for a little girl. And a dress for me was going to be like $400 or something. I'm like, wait a minute. Then you got to get the shoes and, you know, all that. No. No, we not. We can't do it. I didn't even go to the wedding after that because the bride got an attitude. And I was like, Phew. you know, my, my my model, you look just as good going as you did coming. Plus, you know, she wasn't really my friend anyway. His The man she was marrying was hubby's friend. And that's how I met her. So she wasn't really my friend, you know, but you know, he's like, oh, you know, the dress costs this and that. And she wants to, I said, oh, no, we we ain't paying that. That's that's too much money for one day for a growing kid. Are you crazy? I'm not, we, no. So I quickly got shot that shit down. It's like, you know, don't be trying to high side and act like your ass is a Hollywood star with some expensive ass dress for a child. You know, ask something from pennies or something. As long as it's cute. You know, I'm thinking it should be about thirty or forty dollars, not hundreds. So now we, I, well, he went. I didn't. Me and me and the baby didn't go. Question number eight. Female, twenty-eight to thirty-four, from Beaumont, Texas. Summary of issue: My husband wants to bring his special needs sister into our home, and I'm not sure how to approach it because I don't feel comfortable with her around our three-year-old child. How do I go about handling this situation with him? Okay, now you're going to have a whole bunch of stuff about it, but you know, in summary, you summed up the issue right there. You have a three-year-old. He's got a special needs sister. Let's see, he's 34, you're 29. His parents are, had the sister late in life. She's 19. They're both pushing 80. So that means they were in their 60s having a baby? <laughs> they should be slapped into next week for that one. No wonder the kid is all fucked up. My husband has brought this up many times and I have told him time and time again, see, old people should not have babies. They shouldn't have them because that's what happens. They come out defective. I don't feel comfortable having a sister in our home, especially with our very young child. I don't have the headspace to keep track of both. She's nonverbal and can get aggressive when she tries to express herself. How would she be if around a kid crying? That's a big concern. Would she pick up your baby and body slam him to try to shut him up? 
All three of them refused to put her in a group home. I understand the why, but I also do not see another option. My husband recently told me that he really wishes to do this for his parents. He wants them to enjoy their twilight years together in peace. They shouldn't have been having no baby in their 60s. No, let her stay there until they croak. Then put her in a group home. But no, they they created this problem by having a baby when they should be just worrying about grandchildren, great grandkids in their sixties, having a damn baby. Are you out your rabbit ass mind? And he wants them to have peace. No, they decided they didn't want peace when they got pregnant at that age. I told my husband we need to put our own family first. Who's going to pay for these A's anyway? Sure, his sister gets some assistance from the state, but it's not much and it's not reliable. He works and travels, so that leaves her care to me. And I told him that I refuse to be a caregiver for another person while also caring for our child. We have done marriage counseling since this issue many times. And each time he shuts down and claims that no one is listening to him. His point is that it's his sister that did not ask to be born that way to cast to cast her aside because dealing with her is inconvenient. As I've said many times to him, I empathize and sympathize with the situation, but we need to put our kid first. I told him I did not feel capable of being able to handle outbursts that the sister may have, even if they're not often. I told him I don't think that we should be able to afford to cover the hours required for me to feel safe with her in the house with our kid. I also do not think it's a great environment to raise a child. I do not wish to end the marriage or anything. I do love my husband and his kind heart is part of what I respect and love most of all. I get that his heart's in the right place and in the ideal world, this would be a simple situation, but it's not. I cannot help how I feel. And I cannot help my fears and worries. Okay, see, but the main thing here is that he's going to be traveling and he wants to bring his sister there so he can feel better and, and burden the burden, put the burden, take the burden off of his parents, but he wants to put the burden on you. And that's the part where I would tell him, this is not going to happen. The second you bring your sister here, I'm leaving. That's what I would tell him. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to take care of her. And I don't care. Your parents should have used birth control then. That's not my fault. I'm not going to be responsible for your sister and your parents' lackluster situation there where they didn't take proper precautions if they were still actively, you know, re in reproduction mode. That's that's their decision was to have that. They should have got a termination then when she got pregnant. They didn't do that. They wanted to have a baby. So now they got one. And they're going to have it until they, you can't pass off your burden onto somebody else like that. Just like I'm tired. So you take this kid that we made. It don't work like that as a parent. So if they don't, she doesn't put a go into the group home, then he's going to be there have taken care of him trying to figure it out himself. So either the parents keep her, which they really rightfully should because they're the ones that created that hot mess. Or she goes to a group home or he quits his job and stays at home and works at home and takes care of his sister himself. But either way, I'm not going to be there. And that's what you tell him. Tell him the second you do that, because I've, I've told you several times we've been counseling, but I, my answer hasn't changed. I'm not going to do it, period. Not for one fucking day am I going to take care of your sister. Your parents should have used birth control or they should have, you know, they too old anyway. It's like dried wood rubbing together. It's a miracle that motherfuckers didn't catch fire. Two old ass dried up crunchy people trying to do the wild thing. <laughs> I, I don't know. I know my mouth gets terrible, but I, you get my point. They just it was, it, they should have done something different. They were irresponsible and stupid and now trying to put the responsibility and dump it on you. No. So you tell them the second you bring her here, I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just telling you what's going to happen if you do. The second you bring her here, I'm gone. And I'm taking my baby with me because it won't be a safe environment for him to stay here because you aren't, aren't, aren't worried about protecting him at all. And your sister is cuckoo. So that's it. That's that's going to be the end of our marriage. The second she comes in that door and be ready. That's what I would tell his ass. And I wouldn't give a fuck about, you know, love and all that stuff. You better you, you, as your role as a mother is to protect your baby until your baby is old enough to protect itself. And your, the daddy's not worried about the kid. He's worried about his raggedy ass sister. And that's what that's the point that you need to let him. You know, that's why you need to put it that way. You worried about your sister. I'm worried about my son. He's only three years old. He's defenseless. He's a baby. And you want to bring some wild acting, can't talk, waving around, violent acting adult over him and thinking that that's a safe environment for him? As way after after I got told told in court about what happened and how the sister acts, you won't even get visitation, motherfucker. But your ass is still gonna be paying child support. So you think about it: how you gonna afford child support and a caretaker and everything else that's gonna go on that you need to do 
because you're going to have to do it to figure, start figuring it out. And alimony, because that don't, don't sound like she worked, so you're going to have to pay her alimony too. He's going to have to rethink this situation real quick when he realizes how dip his wallet is going to be in, the bad shape his wallet's going to be in. This clown, he, he's trying to beat her into submission. Girl, I'm telling you, you better find your voice and tell him that's fine. Because I've already told you 15 times, I you know all my concerns, but now I'm going to tell you this, and this is the bottom line. The second she comes in this house, I'm leaving with my son, and we're not coming back until she's gone. So you decide. And keep in mind, once I go, child support, alimony, and you're going to have to find a way to take care of her all by yourself because I'm not going to be here. And you're going to have to pay AIDS if you want somebody to help you. So you figure all that out in your budget and how that's going to work for you. And I'm going to be at my mother's. Boop. And be out. I'm trying to tell you. (laughs) No. They always try to figure out some kind of way to dump a problem on the stay-at-home mother. So you didn't sign up for that shit. You signed up to take care of your kid. Not some old people's mistake. Man, my goodness. You better find your voice. All of the way even this is written, you like a coward. You just, uh, you know, scary. The scare type. You better roll your sleeves up and go off on that fool husband of yours. Question number seven. This is a female in the 42 to 49 age group from Toronto, Canada. Some of issue. How do I save my son from a toxic girlfriend? Oh, God, another one? Didn't we have that last week? Something similar? My eight-year-old son was on a great path excelling in sports and was on the path to qualify for the Olympics within the next few years. Since meeting this new girlfriend, though, he has gradually stopped spending time with his friends and family, spending all his free time with her. I've tried to make his girlfriend feel welcome and included at family events. I've given her gifts and baked homemade cookies just for her to take home. I don't know what to do as she never puts forth any effort to talk to me or even thank me after accepting anything I give her. Then why do you keep doing it? Cuss the bitch out. He has recently stopped taking his trainings for specific sports seriously and dropped out of high school. Okay. I told him that he needs to get a part-time job now since he's not in school, but his girlfriend now makes him wait around all day while she goes to school and then she makes him walk with her to and from school. I keep him, try to keep him busy during the day, supporting him and finding jobs and doing activities with him. Every every time he hasn't he isn't waiting outside the high school when his girlfriend has finished for school for the day. She calls him crying and yelling and mentally sad. She mostly abuses him if he doesn't come to her house or stay on the phone with her all day and night. I've told him that this is unhealthy and I've sat down and had many conversations with him. I've done everything I can get to get him to see that he's ruining his life. Please help me. What can I do? Kick him out. Kick him out. And tell him he's 18. He's an adult now and that you're not going to feed or clothe or house him anymore. And that, you know, he's opted to make decisions as an adult. So it's time for him to be one. Tell him to pack his things and to get out. He can go over there with her, live in the park. You don't care where he goes. But you're not going to support a man who doesn't work and who doesn't go to school and doesn't may have any plan to do anything useful with his life. That that, that to See, that's the, that's the mistake that you're making right here. And you coddle him like uh, this. Unbelievable. He's 18 years old. Oh, I'm helping him find a job. You don't help a motherfucker find a job. Even at the eight, at 14, maybe. 15 years old when it's their first time, you help them because you have to sign like a work permit or something. I think if they're under 16, at least in California. But, you know, other than that, what is the point of you helping him? You're going to help him his whole life. That's why he's felt so easily. So pray to some other woman, tell him what to do, because you tell him what to do all the damn time. He doesn't make any decision for himself. It's, It's one woman or another telling him what to do. And you made your son into like a spineless weenie. By controlling him all the time, doing everything for him. He doesn't make any decision. He doesn't suffer any repercussions from stuff. So what you need to do, I'm telling you, kick him out. You and your husband need to pack his little shit up and put him on the other side of the door. Change the locks and tell him he's not welcome there until he decides to go back to school and, and pulls himself up right. Go to school and get rid of that girl and get his life back on track. Then he can come back in the house. Other than that, then say, you know, send us a Christmas card and let us know where you are. Ta-ta. That's what I would do. You can't have it both ways. I'm not going to support you while you destroy yourself and to make me sit around and watch you. You, she thinks it's so great that you have all this convenience. You know, she have all this convenience and stuff. Let's see how great she thinks he is when his ass is covered with leaves and dirt because he's homeless. So you're living, pushing a cart around and stuff. <laughs> okay. 
I think she will quickly change her mind. That's what I would suggest that you do, really, though, because he's 18. He's a grown man now. If he were still 17, you could put him in one of those uh, deprogramming boot camp things where they come and they put a black bag over your head and cart you away. You don't even know where you are. And they keep you there for like three months to deprogram you. That You could have done something like that, but he's an, already an adult, so it's too late. You have no you don't have no power here. Except to kick him out of your house. That no, that power you do have. Question number eight. This is a female in the 22 to 27 age group from London. What kind of issue. My boyfriend wants to be friends with his ex. So oh, does he now? <laughs> this girl messaged me recently saying that it feels awful for her to have been so close to someone and unable to hang out with him and the dog that they got together, who is basically now my dog because we live together. The solution to that is give that dog a special cocktail. No more doggo, no more girlfriend's excuse. Do you feel me? See, Deb just likes to like cut to the chase and like, okay, so this is the problem. Sorry, puppy, you getting ready to disappear. I'm gonna take your ass out to the woods. I'm gonna rehome you some in another state. But whatever happens, you you up out of here. So she wouldn't, she wouldn't, that wouldn't be a good, that's not, no, you need to do something about that. Initially, I told him I don't feel comfortable with him talking in the beginning because he told me that she still wanted to be with him. And I said, I'm not comfortable with them hanging out. I can, oh, one-on-one, -on -one, I'm sorry. Basically, he told me that I can't control him and that he doesn't like that. And while he doesn't seek her out or talk to her often, just me saying I don't want something upsets him. And he says, it's not me to completely X people out of my life after we break up. How would you navigate this? I can get past the occasional text and phone call, but hanging out one-on-one -on -one is virtually impossible for me to feel okay with, especially considering their dynamics and the fact that she told me her healing is stunted because she's not, quote, allowed to hang out with him and the dog. See, the problem is the dog. Do something about the dog and most of these other shit will go away because she won't have any excuse then. On the side, we've also had issues with trust. He's told a co-worker of mine last winter who he knew, who knew, wait, who he knew thought he was cute, that he has issues committing and when he was only when he was my plus one at my work party, he, but he never told me that he was having issues with commitment. Oh, he just trying to just be a player player. We broke up after that, but then got back together. I still can't forget that. That was the last straw of my trust being broken. Then with his ex, after I said, I don't want them hanging out one-on-one, -on -one, he actually tried to get a dinner with her a month after that conversation. I was like, dude, do you not hear me when I talk? Fast forward, it's now a year later. Also, family issues. He said that he wants kids and has randomly said, actually, nope, don't want kids. But then flip-flops and says, yes, I do. I'm trying to allow him not to be perfect, but I don't know if I can do this. How much do we sacrifice of our comfortability and trust in a relationship to try to make it work? In all other areas, he's great. Well, to me, you can't trust the motherfucker. What the hell are you doing with him? Let's just start there. I mean, you can't. How can you love somebody that you don't trust? You got some kind of weird attachment to him, but it can't be love because you got the basic morals and values are different. See, he likes to hang on to the past. And there are a lot of people like that. They like to mix the past with the present. And he knows that she wants him back and he's keeping the door open for her to be around. So what does that tell you? As a smart girl, you should understand the handwriting that's on the wall. He wants her to be around. What does that mean for you? That you are the rebound chick. If you were smart, you would take your stuff and move out and move on from this situation because it's not going gonna, it's not, it's not to go in a circle. He, he's with you, but his heart's over there. But he's with you physically, but he's still too thinking about her and meeting her needs and her, her happiness, her satisfaction with life, her joy. He's not thinking about yours because you are not told him that this is not making you comfortable. And he's like, OK, well, so what? I want, you know, he's thinking about her. So for me, this relationship would be over. It would be just nothing there. I'm not going to compete with your past. And the second he had told me that he, you know, wanted to keep in contact with her and he wants to be friends with his ex and be around, hanging around one-on-one -on -one and stuff like they still dating, I would have said, okay, well, let me pack my stuff and get out of here then. Make room for y'all to do what it is y'all trying to do. Because, see, I, I have too much pride for that. I just cannot be groveling and begging for somebody to love me and taking disrespect to my face and 
letting people run these kind of mind games on me. I'm not going to do that to myself. And I strongly suggest that you follow suit. Okay. So just do saddleness. Understand what's happening here. You're like, you're, you're not is on the level of importance that the ex is. He's more focused on her happiness and peace of mind and satisfaction than he is yours. And that should tell you everything that you need to know. There's no reason for you to even write this letter. Yeah, I'm not doing, you know, you start talking about your ex and all this old stuff here. I'm out. Like I said, unless they have kids, you're going to have to co-parent. But then, you know, I don't like to date men that have young kids anyway. So, you know, by the time they become a teenager, they don't really want to be bothered with the parents. So the parents have visitation. They're like, well, I can't go. I'm hanging out with my friends. We're going to play video games. I'm going over here. We're, you know, they have stuff. I'm going on a date. I mean, they're going to a party. They have stuff to do. So, you know, they really, you talk to them on the phone, but you don't really see them that much because even if you have visitation schedule, because they have other stuff that they want to do. But them little ones, girl, no. Question number nine. This is a male in a 28 to 34 age group from Dallas. Some of issue. My girlfriend has a persistent toxic ex that she doesn't know how to deal with. So my girlfriend's ex is going to get back with her after a relationship of one year that she ended because he was toxic. Now he is always messaging her asking to get back together or he will harm himself and end his life. I have no idea how to deal with this. And she doesn't either, but she doesn't want to get back with him. Yes, she does. You know why it's, I'm saying that? Because she hasn't blocked him. She hasn't changed her number. She hasn't done anything to end his ability to contact her. Please understand this, sir. You call up in her little mind games and stuff. Like, well, I don't know what to do. The fuck she don't. She knows what the hell do. She don't want to do it, though, because she likes drama. And she obviously still has some interest in this dude. Because when you don't have interest in him, you don't want, you change your phone number with the quickness. You even change carriers in case they have a friend that works at that one. You know, they can get your new number. I mean, you go through all kinds of changes to get, get rid of, to prevent someone from contacting you that you don't want to contact you. The fact that she has the same number and he's, he's unblocked and she still takes his calls and talks to him and lets him text her and all that stuff shows that, you know, you not, she ain't your girlfriend like you think she is. That's all I'm going to tell you. Because this, this she playing little bitch games here and getting you caught up or you thinking that you protecting her and all that shit. Which all you have to do is tell her, look, you know what? Obviously, you still interested in him and he's still interested in you. So I'm going to do this out. Boop. If you had any pride in yourself as a man, that's what you would do. She on some bullshit. Trying to make it sound all dramatic and stuff. But he said he's going to do this. I mean, you have no, no proof of that unless you saw a text. But if she just said he called and said that, that's not proof. That could just be her being a drama queen, just trying to stir up some bunch of shit, trying to make you jealous and stuff. Uh, but see, again, this is a thing where you have to determine what your pride level is and how much bullshit you're going to tolerate in your relationship. My level of understanding and, and tolerance is like is minus zero, minus, wait, down to, under below zero, like minus whatever. I just not going to do it. And, you know, this kind of thing here, um, you know, she's trying to act like she's an innocent victim and all this old stuff. And like I said, I could see it if she had changed her number or blocked it and somebody gave him the number and he's harassing her. But she hasn't done anything. She hasn't said, stop calling me. She hasn't blocked him. She hasn't changed her number. She hasn't done anything. And yet here you are all stressed out about it. You dumped that stupid broad. Let her go on back over there to that crazy clown that was so, oh, so toxic. If he was oh, so toxic, don't you think she would have blocked him? Don't you think she would have changed the number? Think about this now. Be, be logical and reasonable. Be real. She ain't done none of that. So how toxic was he really? She on some bullshit. Question number 10. This is a female in the 22 to 27 age group from Doncaster, South Yorkshire. Never heard of it. The man in, in the art, uh, the man in question here is in the 28 to 34 age group. Summary of issue. My boyfriend got rid of some of my clothes. How do I talk to him about this in a productive way? What you going to think you're going to protect him and he's going to appear, the clothes going to reappear? I'm 20. My boyfriend is 28 and I'm 22 and we've been together for almost two years. See, they always talk about the length of time. Always. We recently moved in together. So we've been trying to adjust to that. I recently went with my family for a week to see another side of my family. My boyfriend didn't want to go, but he was very much invited. He didn't want me to go either because he thought I was being irresponsible. I disagreed because I 
go work and I was plenty of time and I could afford it. So I got back last weekend and when I got home, he had rearranged almost everything. I was sort of upset because I think he should have talked to me first. I didn't think it was worth making a big deal about it, so I didn't say anything. I noticed that my closet had a lot less in it, but thought that he put some of the things in the guest room where I had already put some of my stuff. I realized yesterday I was missing a lot of my things and couldn't find other things. I asked him about it. And he told me that he went through everything in the house and got rid of some of my stuff because it was taking up space and I don't wear them anyway. I did wear a bunch of those things and I know this and I know he hasn't kept track of what I do and don't wear in his head. He brought me a necklace when I got home. So I haven't talked to him about this yet because I would feel like uh, an a-hole. I want to sit him down this weekend and go over it without getting into an argument. Oh, that's impossible. I don't want to be walked all over, but also don't want to make this a huge deal. Should I bring this up? I already told him not to do that in the future. Yes, you should bring it up and you should make him pay you for the things that he threw away. If you can remember the, if you can recall the values of those things and the specific items, then you can pretty much remember what you paid for them and tell, hold out your hand and say, give me the money because you had no right to throw away my property. So like, you know, if I took you to small claims court, I could win because you did something that you shouldn't have done with property that did not belong to you. Okay. So you're going to give me that money so I can go and rebuy my stuff. That's what I would do. And then if he didn't want to do it, I would go and I would go in his closet and I would give away some of his shit. That's what I would do. That eye for an eye thing. I'm just evil like that. I'm going to give away some shit and then I'm going to go in your, with something that you really like, some sports memorabilia or something. I'm going to give that shit away too. Or maybe sell it so I can get the money to buy my stuff back. That's what we're going to do. You're not going to do some shit to me and don't think that you're going to get away with the scot free. Oh, no. If I'm suffering, you're going to suffer too. We're going to be suffering motherfuckers. That's what we're going to be together. So you think about that. Now, I don't know if you had a gumption to pull it off, but that's what I would do. First, I would make him give me the money. Just a little fly thing in here. I'd make him give me the money. And if he didn't, you know, didn't agree to do that, I would just wait till he wasn't home, pick up a bag up a whole bunch of his shit, put it in my car and run down to the homeless encampment and start flinging shit out the window. Say, here's some fresh, nice new clothes for you guys. Help yourself. Shoes too. That's what I would do. Then he would come back. I can't find myself. Oh, yeah. Isn't that a weird feeling? I know exactly what you're talking about. Having just gone through that myself. And he would sit there and look stupid. But you know what he did? This, this is his passive aggressive way because he was mad that you went to visit your family and left him there. That's what that was. Even though he chose to be there, he's, this is his temper tantrum. This is how he got back at you. He's gonna, this is how his way of making you pay for doing what you did, which was a normal thing to go visit relatives. So be very careful with this guy. I don't know. It might not be, it might be good to, Girl, yes, to the homeless encampment, because, you know, they're going to put the shit on and then they got like lights and shit. So he's not going to want to try to get it back. But yeah, that's what I would do. So it'd be like a whole bunch of fly ass looking homeless men down in the encampment with your shit on. Wearing your Jordans and whatnot. He would be sad, but that's what I that's how I would do it, because I'm just vindictive like that. I'm not going to suffer. And you think you're just going to be having a jolly good time at my expense. Oh, no. You must suffer too. And more, uh, more likely more than I do. So, you know, finding whatever shoes is one of his favorites, I would make sure them motherfuckers disappeared. Make him wear some loafers or some flip-flops or some shit. <laughs> Clown. But you be careful with this guy. You know, you might want to consider moving back out because I'm, you know, this, this is a really bad start. I mean, you just moved in. And he's already showing signs of being toxic and controlling. So I don't know what you didn't notice before you moved in and what changed, but this is this is some really this is a red flag. You better pay attention. Question number eleven. God, I can only be on question number eleven. Ooh. Yeah, you know, I told you how I did my, that's how, you know, what is it about me and people that taking my stuff and doing something? Because my cousin, one of my, well, she's like a second cousin. She was staying with Joy, right? I knew she was staying with Joy for a minute, but she had come to my house and she stole a short set that I had just bought. You remember when Kente cloth was, you know, all the rage, like in the nineties, early two thousands, I had this, you know, short set 
It was cute. Only wore it like one time. She came to my house and the short set disappeared. Now I knew it, I missed it because I had just bought it, right? So I'm like, okay, who's been in my house? I start thinking. So I call up Joy. I said, did you see, I'm not going to say her name, wearing something that looked like this? And I described it. She said, yeah, she had that on. And I said, I'm going to be at your house in a few minutes. I jump in my car and I go to their house. She lived all the way in Fairfield. So, you know, it was a haul from Oakland there. So I get there and stuff. I said, is she here? She said, no. I came in with my hefty bags. You know, I love hefty bags. And I went in the drawer. I said, show me all her stuff. And she was standing in that room right there. I bagged up all her shit, all of it. Panties, bras, socks, shoes, every single ounce of clothes that was in that room that belonged to her. I put it in my hefty bag, flung it down the stairs and put it in my trunk. Drove the fuck off. So I said, so she joy, you know, because she was just looking because she could tell I was pissed. So she didn't say anything. It's like, well, what happened? I said, she stole my shit. So now I'm taking all of hers. So the only thing she's going to have to wear is that short set. She's like, cousin, that's so vicious. I'm like, yeah, but I had to teach that little bitch. Don't you come to my house stealing shit? Because now you know you, you, you got a new short set, but that's all your bitch ass got. Oh, I was mad. I can't even tell you the rage. I probably drove up there in like 20 minutes. I was flying so fast. I was so mad. But yeah, that's how I do people. I'm not going to get mad at you. I'm going to get even. So after that, she was, you know, I'll give it back. I don't want it. You still got your funky underarm smells on it and shit. I don't want that shit now. But you're going to give me some money for it. And then you can get your stuff back. Because it was still in my trunk. I didn't you know, do nothing with it. So I made her give me that $50. And, you know, and then I was fine. But it's like, I'm not going to suffer no loss, you know, because you want to be a thief. So um, that's how I do stuff, just as an example. I don't. You can't treat me like that. It's not, it's not going to work. You're going to suffer. If you do anything to me, I'm going to make sure of it. So, yeah, that's how I rolled on, out on that on her. She didn't know what to say. That story went through the family. So, like, damn, she's like, she's like a savage. She's like the mafia. Like, I don't know, whatever. But, you know, just don't be coming to my house. It's my, you know, my personal space. Don't come up in here acting stupid. And don't touch my shit. Don't you break nothing. Don't you take nothing. And then we'd be all right. But she violated the rule. Girl, yeah. <laughs> I told you I was a petty empress of the world. And I don't even know where that thought came from. I was like, I just, I just when, when I was talking to Joy and she told me that she had it on, you know, she had it on. I just, something just went through me. I said, I'll be right there. And I got, I, you know, and I threw, had the garbage bags in my trunk already. So, yeah, that was, that was, that was crazy. I don't even know what possessed me, but. Something happened and I just lost my mind for a minute. Okay, let's move on to question number 11. This is a young lady, 20 to 34 from San Jose, California. Sort of issue, how do I stop older men from approaching me in public places? Well, get you a big old dog. Get you a Rottweiler, a Doberman, a pit, but you know, they kind of unpredictable. I mean, I think pits are better with men because they're so strong. Um. I don't know, some kind of vicious, vicious dog that will scare them. So I'm just tired of this. I want to go on my day and do my groceries or chores without being stopped by someone to be asked way too many personal questions. I'm not venting about cat callers. If I look this question up online, you only find tips on how to get rid of guys who approach you to quote date. Those tips don't help here. So I'm writing to you. The men who come to me always start with a standard neighborhood talk albeit a bit too long, but I blame their chattiness on their age, usually 60 or 70 plus. I am 30, by the way. There's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't stay with that one time. They come to me when they see me again. They walk with me. They ask personal questions. They never do it in a way that is considered wrong, but you know, they never talk to a man that way. I honestly don't know why they come at me because you're a female. I'm nothing like whatever the standard beauty is at any time, and I'm not exactly feminine. I'm an introvert, neurodivergent, though. It usually isn't considered welcoming to people. I just want to go on my day with, in peace. I'll ask an elderly man who seems to be struggling if he needs a hand, and I need to avoid that specific place where I don't know how long. I can be walking, and if a man starts to walk next to me, even in the supermarket, they'll come at me. Or just on the road, where are you going? Or did you just come back from work? They all start with the stories about their families and tell about a monument in town or share an old memory. It's all good. Then, of course, the questions about my dating life begin, and it's all ruined. 
Sometimes I even have to touch my hair. Oh, fuck no. That's when you need to pull out your pepper spray and give them a dose. I don't want to share them any personal information. A part of my mind tells me to just avoid all men except family, but that seems unfair too. Unfair? No, it's unrealistic though. Surely most people are still kind. No, they're not kind. If they got a dick, they're not kind. Let me tell you something here, little girl. You are too old to be acting like this brand new. Let's go over this situation that you presented. Okay, you be asked personal questions. Okay, that will crack calls. Okay, not that page. They always start with the standard neighborhood talk of all the way too long. Okay, you don't know how to say, okay, well, I need to get going. I'm running errands and stuff. Nice to talk. Nice meeting you or whatever. Have a good day and walk the fuck off. You don't know how to do that? Mid-sentence. You don't have to wait for them to stop talking. You just start walking. Okay, just walk off. Then, okay, so then you say, come to see me again. They ask personal questions. My standard thing I've said 55 million times on this show, when people ask you personal questions, your standard answer should always be, why would you need to know that? I've been using that since I was a young teen. Why would you need to know that? Because it was always a curiosity to me. Why you would you, Why would you need to know that? And I mean, I, it was serious. Why would you need to know that, says Deborah. And then inevitably, you know, you do it the head, the puppy head tilt thing that puppies do. You know, and then it looked confused, like, you know, what's the point here? And they usually stumble around and their eyes dart around and they can't really figure out what they, why did they need to know? They just nosy. So then that's when you say, okay, Pinocchio, um, I'm going to get going now. And enjoy your day. Have a good day or some bullshit like that that you don't really mean. But it's a way of saying sayonara, chump. Okay, then, um, you know, they want to walk with you. And then you say, don't walk with me. I don't know you. Get away from me. No, I, I didn't invite you to walk with me. Get away from me. Stop it. And say it in a commanding tone of voice. But you just let them do it. See, another one with no spine. You just, you know, and then they, I can just see you answering the questions that they ask you just for no reason that makes sense. And then you say that, you know, you're a neurodivergent introvert. You know, that's the kind of thing that attracts the predators. Because you look, you don't look sharp. You don't look like you know what's happening and you don't look, you look defenseless and weak. So in other words, you know, you need to fi figure out what kind of way you're going to fix your face. That's why, you know, they talk about young black girls walk around with a scowl on their face like they uh, ice cube or something. But it, that's part of the defense mechanism. You don't want to be, and they tell you to smile. Fuck you. I'm not smiling for you. You paying me to smile? If you're not paying me to smile, then leave me alone. Don't be trying to give me, don't tell me what to fucking do with my face. Stuff like that. You know, we just, the Oakland be coming out. So then you want to go, okay, you, the older, elderly man seemed to be struggling and he needs a hand. Fuck his ass. Just let him struggle. He's a man. He don't need you. He didn't ask you for your help. Let some other man help a man. Okay, never help a man. That is the number one rule on this channel. You don't help men do anything. You see a man struggling, you wait till the other men help his ass or he'll just figure it out. He didn't get to be old by himself. He's got some smart and some strength somewhere. You keep it moving. And if it looks like it's a criminal thing, they call 911, but you still keep it moving. Don't get involved. That could be a trap too. Suddenly you sitting up there thinking you helping somebody and this four or five guys come and lift your silly ass up and throw you in a car. We never see you dump your dumb ass again. Stop being so fucking helpful to strange men. Just let them sit there. And then, so then you say your man starts walking next to you. That's why you need pepper spray. Or you on the road, where are you going? None of your goddamn business. Or did you just come back from work? None of your goddamn business. You could change goddamn the fucking, I mean, don't, well, either one works. But you know, you don't answer their questions and you have to respond in a way that shows aggression. And then they'll be like, oh, oh. you know, I didn't know. I didn't. You know, this kind of thing. Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. When you be all nice and quiet and smart, you know, looking scared and intimidated and shit, they take that as a sign of, you know, this is, this is a go. Man. See, that's the, that's the advantage of being raised up in the hood. You just, you don't be taking no shit like this from these clowns. Tell them where to go and how to get there, which exit to take.
I'm just, I, I just don't even understand it. But it's like, this is a repetitive pattern. We talked about this last week with young girls of this generation not being taught boundaries and not being taught that they have to have a voice and to be assertive and stand up for themselves. This is a repetitive pattern. The weakness and, it, you know, the, well, I'm scared. I'm going to be, you know, I want to be nice. Nice don't exist in my vocabulary unless I'm with these people here. These people are nice to me and I'm nice to them. You know, some of my family and stuff, I'm nice to them. But everybody else, I don't give a fuck about them people. If it's going to be a choice between my feelings and theirs, guess who's going to be hurt? It's not going to be mine. I don't worry about that kind of stuff. I don't go out of my way to hurt people. Don't get me wrong. But if it comes down to a choice between whose feelings are going to be hurt between mine and someone else's, it's going to always be to someone else. It's never going to be me. Let's move on. Question number 12. This is a male in the 28 to 34 age group from London. Summary of issue. My fiance is pissed at me and it's 100% my fault. Obviously, everything here is 100% my fault, but I want to get your opinion on it. Next weekend is my birthday. And it's also the day that my fiance's father is opening a show he's directing out of town. We had planned for me to request off next weekend. I'm also a performer who's scheduled to do two shows. And the re and she reminded me to do so several times, but I neglected to do it until recently. As a result, my fiance is in a terrible position of either having to miss her father's show and her last chance in a while to see her family members or missing my birthday. I'm not sure what to do. Any advice would be appreciated. You're going to cancel those days off that you requested and move that shit out a week or two. And then you're going to celebrate your, you're going to go to the thing with your girlfriend and then you're going to celebrate your birthday a week or two later. Some people, you know, because look at you, wait, 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 how, let me see how old you, what age group did I say you were in? Okay. You, okay. You in the 28 to 34 age group, you're not five. You don't have to celebrate your birthday on the day anymore. People know adults do that. They celebrate on the weekends. Or a week later, if they have to go, they're trying to go on a trip. It could be a month later. They, this is my birthday celebration. So you insisting that it has to be on that day, like a big baby? She did. She should cuss you out and break up with you. So you move your you move your request days off for your what you're gonna take for your birthday. Move them. Go with her to this thing for her father. Take, take her there so she can see all her family and stuff, and you can see them too. And then y'all go home. Or if you want to have something the next day, you can, they can go to lunch or something. But the big celebration, if you talk about a party and having friends and over and all that stuff, you're going to do that another weekend. You know what I mean? Who still do worries about the actual day anymore past the five or six years old? You tripping. Yes. <laughs> Anna using my phrase. Grow up, sir. That's right. What a knucklehead. Oh, how are these men so stupid? I mean, couldn't you guys... Anybody should have been able to figure that out. He had the right to a, to a complete stranger to ask how what he should do when he put a big old foot in his mouth and messed up. Question number 13 of 25. This is taking me forever to get through these questions. I got to stop going to my side stories. Female 18 to 21 from Seattle. Some of issue. A creepy guy at the gym. Am I overreacting or should I just suck it up? Why do we get these letters? We get at least two or three of these letters every month. Creepy dudes at the gym. Dudes, if you're a creepy dude at the, at the gym, creeping up on young women, stop it. Stop it. Let them work out in peace. You fucking weirdo. So about two or three weeks ago, I was at the gym using a squat machine and an older guy started to stare at me and he went to the squat rack that was right next to the one I was losing while I was in the middle of doing my set of hip dress. What is that? I don't. Maybe she means hip thrust. She must mean hip thrust. I don't know what she means. He came over to me and asked what my name is. And I told him my name. Okay. Why did you do that? And he said, that's a beautiful name. Then he introduced himself and he asked if I was from the area. And I told him, no. And he asked me where I was from. And I told him where, why did you do that? See what I mean? Young girl, stop being so free with information about yourself. You don't know what these men are asking you that stuff for. You don't know who these clowns are. Who they know and what their intention is with you. You in the age where women get sex trafficked. Stop telling men personal stuff about yourself. Stop putting shit on the internet. Stop checking in everywhere so people can always see where you're going to be at a certain time because you just put your whole life on the internet for the world to see. Stop being stupid. 
this is so dangerous. These girls are disappearing like 20 a day every day throughout the country, or probably more than that. And it, it, you guys just so fucking unaware of what you're doing and don't even think. This should have never happened. She should have never been telling this man anything like that. Oh, I'm getting so upset. This is just terrible. He asked me where I was going to school, and I told him, no, my brother lives here, and I'm just visiting. And he asked me where, where I was from, and he thinks it's really beautiful there. And yeah. See what I mean? So now he knows her name. He knows where she goes to school and what, where she lives. All from a complete stranger that just walked up to her at the gym. She doesn't know this clown from a hole in the fucking ground and or what his reasons are, what he's going to do with this information. If anything, if you have to do it, do like we used to do in the 80s. We used to have a club name. This is way before the internet. We had a club name. It wasn't our real name. Our club name. So we know if some dude called us and he asked for this person, you know, we knew where we met him at the club. Please adopt that policy and get you a Google phone number. Stop giving people your real cell phone number. Okay, so the gym is really, really crowded. He asked me to come to, do I come to the gym often? I said, yes. And he said, okay, maybe we can get a few rounds in together. And I just laughed it off. He's supposed to say, no, you're too old. You're old and I don't deal with old men. That's what you were supposed to say to him. Then after that, 30 or so minutes later, he came back to me and asked what time I would be back tomorrow. And I wasn't thinking anything of it. And I told him and he was like, see? And I was like, okay, I'll see you tomorrow and we can work out together. I didn't want to, obviously, but it was in the heat of the moment. And I was kind of not thinking. You can't be this brand new being around these slick ass old men. This is the same shit I said last week. Oh, my God. Just fucking stupid. Well, I didn't see. So it's anyway, so she didn't go and he thought it was creepy or something. And then it says, well, I didn't see you the next day or a couple of days after that. I think she's meant to see him. Thank God. But last week I was at the squat wreck doing legs again. And this time I was doing squats and I look up and he's towering above me really close. So I back up and he's just like, where have you been? And I was like, like what you've been here. And he's like, yeah, I've been looking for you. I haven't seen you. And I was like, oh, well, I've been here and then I had to do some stuff came up with my schedule. So maybe our time didn't coordinate. And I was like, oh, and then he says like, yeah, I told myself I saw you again, though. I was going to run you down and get your number so that we can stay in contact. And I was like, oh, and then he was like, what are you doing tomorrow? Are you coming to the gym tomorrow? Do you come on the weekend? I was like, no, he's like, well, maybe we can do a session on Monday. And I was like, oh, trying to brush him off, but he didn't budge. And then he pulled out his phone and said, let me get your number. And you didn't know how to say no. I don't want to talk to no creepy man at the gym. You're old enough to be my father. You couldn't say that because he's more than twice your age. <sighs> so anyway, she gives him the guy the number. She says, I was a little scared because, you know, you tell a guy these days and they just start raging. So he asked me to spell my name and I told him, and then he said, okay, what's your number? Pretty lady. And I gave him my number and then, my mind, I wanted to give him a fake number, but he said, okay, I'm going to call to make sure. So he called, and he's like, show me. And I showed him my phone that isn't popping up. He was like, okay, my name is blank. And I was like, okay, then you should have blocked him, but you didn't. So I was on the floor doing dress ups again. And he comes up behind me and he taps me and just puts the thumbs up. And I just gave him a weird smile. And then after that, maybe 45 minutes passed and he came up to me and he was like, I'm about to leave. And he put his hand on my back. And then he goes, I'm going to give you a call. So just look out for my call so we can make sure to get our session in. Okay. This letter is way too long. I'm going to skip this. So, so evidently he tried to, she was creeped out. He was close to touching her butt area, his hand sliding down her back. She didn't tell the people in the gym, all of this. That night he called. I didn't pick up. He left a voicemail. I didn't read it back. I didn't call back. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. I'm 19 and he had to be no younger than 45. So it's creepy to me that I'm at a point in my life where I'm trying to prove to myself and my family that I can handle myself. But this is really creeping me out. And I want to know if I should pretend my brother so he can come with me and possibly scare the guy off. Or should I just go and tough it out? Nope. You should tell your brother since you're there visiting him so that when you go the next couple of times, your brother can go with you since you're stupid. And you have a stupid loose, loose lips and you don't know how to fucking keep your mouth closed and not tell strange men all your personal affairs.
So you need your brother there to run intervention. Hopefully he's got more sense than you. So you, I want you to tell him, you could actually show him this clip so that he can understand how dumb his sister is and how much she needs somebody to guard, safeguard her because you just like a loose cannon. You don't talk to, you don't tell me enough stuff like that. You don't, they ask you questions just because somebody asked you something, you don't have to give them the answer. And you definitely don't have to tell them the truth. So he want to know, well, where are you from, New York? If you, could be in, you could be in California, New York. I live in Brooklyn. Well, you don't have an accent. I know, but I, you know, I'm really good because my family's from where here. And so we don't have an accent, a Brooklyn accent. But yeah, I mean, just lie. What you feel like you need to tell us complete strangers the truth for? Man, I be coming up with some doozies. I, sometimes I think, man, am I a sociopath? Because I'd be lying to these motherfuckers like there's no tomorrow. But I only do it to strange men because they're the ones that are trying to be intrusive and nosy in my business. So I just let my imagination run wild. And I just say whatever, you know, just whatever comes to mind. Well, what's your name, Leticia? <laughs> Next time you'd be like, what's your name, Wanda? I thought you said your name was Leticia. Well, that's my middle name. So it's Wanda Leticia, yes. <laughs> Wanda Leticia Jones. <laughs> oh. You guys, dude, girls, come on now. You cannot be acting like this. Stop telling me and stuff about yourself. They ask you a question, just like I said, you know, it's a non-confrontational way, but it definitely backs people up off you to say, well, why would you need to know that? And so, you know, he's like, what's your name? Why would you need to know that? Well, because I want to get to know you, but it's an, I don't want to get to know you, though. So leave me alone. I'm working out here. That's all you had to say. He's like, oh, come on, come on, be, be nice. You know, this no, fuck nice, because nice is not really what I want to be. I'm trying to work out and, and get my workout on. And you're bothering me. Do I need to go to, to get the, the uh, staff involved? Are you going to leave me alone? And then he would back, you know, they do this thing like this. Okay, okay. And then they back up, they act, you know, all dramatic and over over just doing the most, trying to act like they're so fucking offended. It's like, don't make me go off up in this gym and call you every kind of thing but a child of God. Yeah. Well, I mean, she just needs to get her, you know, but see, this is the thing I said, I said, I fought parents for this because they don't talk to their daughters. They don't teach them anything, you know? So it's like, you know, yeah, she's 19 and she should be, she should be smarter than this about handling herself in the world. She can't be just running around loose or brand new like this. I mean, even in my era, we didn't act, you know, we weren't acting like that all brand new, but you know, these days, you know, people had never heard. I mean, they had pimps, but no, you know, this this like mass trafficking stuff now where they ship women, people all over the world and stuff like that. They have these underground things. So your parents may never see your little silly ass again. And you don't let this man know where you go to school and where you live and what your real name is. I just, I can't even understand it. He's standing, putting his hands on you. You're supposed to kick him in his nuts and tell him, get the fuck away from me. Don't be putting your hands on me, motherfucker. You done lost your damn mind. And say it loud so he gets embarrassed. You don't just sit there and run, like, cowering like a little, little mouse. That's how they know that they can get you because you don't have any spine. You don't stand up for yourself. And they see you weak. And they know that they can just take advantage of you because of that weakness. Y'all drive me crazy with this shit. Oh, parents, please do better with your daughters. Do better with your daughters. Question number 14. This is a male in the 20 to 34 age group, no location provided. So I have an issue. How do I tell a woman how I feel about her actions? Well, let's see what you're talking about here. Something personal happened in my life, and there's this woman in her late 20s. We were essentially strangers, but we say hi every now and then, and she seemed nice. She knew what happened and gave me her number and said if I ever wanted to chat, I could text her. So I have quite a few times. Well, there's your mistake. She didn't respond the first five times, then she did, but only to the sixth one. Then it happened again, a bunch of messages ignored. Then a reply, sometimes she'll ignore some of my messages, but respond to some parts, and it's just, I don't get it. Now it's been even more messages without any reply at all. 
We also see each other in person and chat then too. And it seems like she tells me things that she wouldn't tell just a rando. So I don't get why she would ignore my messages. Then in person, she'll ask me about the things that I've already told her in the text. And I don't just give a few word replies. There have been some where I pretty much bared my soul and got nothing. I'm having a bad day and feel like shit and then feel like double shit when she ignores me. Part of me just wants to go like, it's all in the text. I already told you all of this. Don't you ever check your text? Do you even care? But that's the a-hole version. How can I tell her how I feel about this? And that it hurts maybe more than it should without coming off as rude. And lately, some of our in real life uh, interactions seem awkward. Seems like I'm intruding on her and she's just putting up with me. She'll give me one word responses like she wants me to stop, barely look at me. And after I just walk away, it seems like she doesn't care. Yet whenever I say I don't want to bother her, she says, oh, no, you're not. Yet I feel something's off. Just very distant. And it isn't like, wasn't like this before. I don't know. This is kind of a ramble now. Sorry. Yeah, you all over the place. But you know what it is? You're doing too much. Now, when people say that they don't really mean it, you unfortunately thought she meant it. And then you start sending her whole blocks and walls of text day after day after day. Don't you know that you're getting on her nerves? She's not going to tell you you're getting on her nerves, but I'm telling you that you're getting on her nerves. And that's why she's responding the way she is and avoiding you. Stop this. Get you a shrink if you need to talk to somebody. You putting it overloading her. She said, if you ever need to talk, you know, she didn't mean like, like what you doing, like every day, you know, walls of text from repetitively over and over and over and every little thing you want to talk to her about it. That's not what she meant. She's not your emotional support dog. If that's what you need, get you one and get you a shrink or some shit. That's why she, she's trying to be polite, hoping you can get a fucking clue. So I'm trying to tell you now, stop texting this chick and get you a shrink. And then you do all that talking to you to shrink and not to her. And then you know, you got people telling you that they know what happened and all that stuff saying, never mind, I got to handle. Be a fucking man, okay? Handle your business. You don't let women put themselves in a position of supporting you. You get a man to do that shit. Unless you're married, then your wife might do it sometimes if she's in a good mood. But it's really not any any woman's job to support your emotional state, sir. That's your job to do. And you get you some friend, male friends or you get you a shrink. That's what that's for. Go see a priest, something along those lines. But, you know, you dumping on random women like that, that's that's just never going to make you look manly and competent. She, she sees you as a weak, spineless ninny that was like to whine and cry and shit. And that's just not sexy at all. So stop this. Women, I mean, you know, even if she, yeah, he. He just like just dumping on her and she's trying to figure out a way to let him know. That's why she's ignoring his ass and he just keeps sending more and more and more texts. That's dumb. Whew. Question number 15. This is a female in the 20 to 34 age group from the UK. So an issue. I move it out, but I don't know how to break the news to my brother. Hmm. I'm 33 and co-own a home with my brother who is 30. Our mother is disabled and lives with us. We don't have the best relationship and fight often. Living with him has caused my mother and I so much stress and grief. We feel we need to walk on eggshells every day. I'm the sole provider for my mom, my brother, and his girlfriend. What? You stupid. They don't have jobs and have refused every time we bring it up. Recently, things have come to a head, and mom and I have made plans to move out. We're taking a huge financial hit moving from a paid-for house to an expensive rental, but we can't live in the toxicity anymore. I haven't told him, and we are moving out very soon. I just don't know how to tell him. I'm worried about leaving him high and dry. I don't want him to suffer, but we can't live like this anymore. I know he's going to be hurt and angry and feel betrayed. I'm all torn up about the whole situation. I wish it could have happened differently, but I no longer feel safe in my own home. I just don't know how to tell him. What you do is you get you an attorney and you start making motions to sell the house. You two are going to split the money. So then he will have money and you won't have to worry about him you know, being destitute and all that, then you're going to take your money that you get from the house and you and your mother are going to buy like a little condo or something. It's just for the two of you, you only need two bedrooms, maybe three, so you have a little office or something there. And that's where you're going to live. And you're not going to tell your brother where you are and he's not going to come and visit you. And you're not, he, he's going to have his money. He can do what he wants to do with his money, but let him know this is it. We're going to split it 50, 50. And then when, when it's, when it's done, when you're out of money, you better have a job because don't come looking for me because you it's not going to happen. I'm definitely not going to be supporting that bitch that you sleeping with. So, you know, you tripping with that. Uh, that She would not have been in my house, eating up my food and running up the light bill 
and using up the toilet paper and stuff. It's like, bitch, get out, get you a job and go, go get on welfare or something. Do something with yourself. But I'm not supporting you. I don't understand your, you see another person who's weak. Then she came up in there talking about she moving there. No, you don't. You got to pay to live here. You ain't family and you ain't his wife. You just some raggedy bitch he's screwing. So get out of here with that. You don't, you, I'm going to get, if you don't move voluntarily, I'm going to get the, the, what you call it, police to come and drag you up. So you need to figure that all out. That's what you do. That's what you do. Okay. You sell the house. You don't just let them have the house. I mean, what about the taxes and repairs on the house and all that kind of stuff? If you call it, then you'll be the one, you're the only one with a job. You'll be the one financially responsible. Cut the losses immediately and immediately sell that house. Put the house on the market. Whether he likes it or not, then tell him, did you buy me out then? <laughs> Screaming. I'm just saying. He buys you out or you sell the house and split the money. And then you and your mother move to Florida or some damn where. Question number 16. This is a young man in the 20 to 34 age group from Vacaville, California. Some of issue. I have a neurological disorder which prohibits me from driving. How should I present this to women? I'm 31. I have a decent job and I love studying languages. I speak German and some Spanish. I read and I lift weights. I'm not bad looking either. However, I don't drive and I have been afraid to go out and meet women because of this. When I was younger, I was active on dating sites and had tons of dates. But that was when I was 18 to 21, and it wasn't so bad not to have a car or license. But now at 31, it's difficult to date. I know it's a deal breaker for a lot of women, which I get since I am in the U.S. However, I still think there are women out there that wouldn't have an issue with it. I don't want kids, which also makes it a lot easier. I also don't expect anyone to drive me around and have no problem paying for a car payment or gas if my partner has a car and she drives around for dates and stuff like that. Oh, that's that's nice. I think a lot of people would go for that. I have a neurological disorder, so things like driving, riding a bike, anything with motor skills is really hard for me. I've been afraid to just try and go on dates because of the likely rejection. So how should I present this? Should I just show up on a date and walk out of an Uber with no explanation? Should I explain it before the date or am I overthinking it? Thanks for your help and advice, Deb. Well, I would bring it up if, you know, you're going to go on a date and um, she's going to say, well, can, are you going to pick me up or something like that? And you say, and say unfortunately, um, I have a health condition that prevents me from driving a neurological disorder. So things like you just said here, things like riding a bike and things that require fine, fine motor skills um, are a challenge for me. And so um, I don't I don't do that because I don't want to risk my life or anybody else's. Okay. That's all you say. And very matter of fact, don't engage, don't embellish it. Don't be apologizing for it. Just state the facts. And she's going to be like, oh. And you say, you know, so I can, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get there though. I'll, you know, get you there. I'll get there to meet you. And um, so don't worry about it. I, I got it under control. I've lived this long and gotten around it and doing everything that I want to do. I, it's not any expectations on you to do anything. Okay, make that clear so she understands that you're not looking to load her up with responsibility. Then if you two decide to move forward with uh, continue dating, then what you can do is, you know, let her know, say, hey, you know, I, we, I know we're using your car and I don't, since I don't drive, how about if I help you with your auto insurance and, and gas or something? Or, you know, make a payment every now and then or something like that. How would you, how would you feel about that? And see what she says. She might say no. She might be, you know, that might be nice when she might like that. So I would approach it that way, but don't go come out the gate offering to make payments for people. Wait, wait until y'all is in a relationship and then, um, you know, then you offer that. That's what I would do. That would be my recommendation. So don't try to hide it, but only bring it up when, you know, if you guys decide to meet and she asks about you picking her up, because usually they just say, well, let's, let's meet there. Then you don't have to, because it might just be a one-time thing and then you would have just Told all your business for no reason. So we'll just wait on that. Don't be so free. Question number 17. This is a female in the 18 to 21 age group from San Mateo, California. Same issue. I brought up relationship concerns with my boyfriend and he kind of just downplayed and deflected on everything. Where do I go from here? Did I approach it wrong? My boyfriend and I, I'm 19 and he's 20, have been in a situation, oh, I'm sorry, a relationship for about six months. A few times I've tried to communicate my needs and feelings 
concerns and boundaries, et cetera. And his reaction is to deflect or downplay the issue, which just makes me frustrated and the issue never gets addressed. Possible mitigating factors. My immediate family is not great at communicating, so I have no examples of really healthy communication. So maybe my approach is too direct or accusatory. Example, this context this is in a family gathering. So she's giving like a little script. Well, your sister was really rude to me just now and you didn't back me up when I stood up for myself. Next time, can you do something, please? We should have each other's back. And I felt a little abandoned back there, end quote. Please tell me what I'm doing to make him respond by minimizing my concerns, making excuses or just deflecting by making jokes, deliberately misconstruing what I'm saying and being a contrarian for funsies. It makes me feel unheard and like he isn't trying to work as a team to solve problems. Then I get frustrated and we go back and forth and the issue goes nowhere, but not before creating a bunch of drama that could have been avoided. How do I learn to resolve conflict properly? That not what you said is perfect. The problem is not you, it's him. He's extremely immature. I mean, just like to the level where he's about like acting like a 12 year old. What you need to do is dump him. You got, you got six months in, get you a man, a grown man, not somebody who acts like a, you know, a adolescent. He doesn't want, he doesn't, he's not, he's minimizing because he doesn't want to do anything about the problems. He wants to have like this fairy tale, perfect relationship where you never need anything from him. He never has to do anything. It's never inconvenient. He's never burdened. He doesn't have any responsibility. That's what he wants. That's what he's looking for. And that's not realistic. And that's not an adult relationship. So you, re you need to understand, stop bumping your head on the wall. You're just dating. You've only been with him for six months. You found out who he is now. Now leave him alone. Okay. Just tell him, you know, the way that you communicate is not going to, it's not working for me. I need a man that I can resolve conflict with and that talks and it takes my feelings and my needs and seriously, that's not you. So we're going to end this. Okay. And I'll talk to you in another lifetime. Ciao. That's all you got to do. Yeah. He's just stupid. Just, that's the dummy. Question 18 of 25, we 25 questions today, as usual. Female, 18 to 21 from Miami, Florida. Summary of issue, how do I get a guy to want me again? Is it true guys want a girl when the girl doesn't want them? I never showed interest and he wanted me. I finally gave in and showed interest and now he's distant. What the fuck is wrong with men? Do I have to not show interest again to get him to want me again? No, what he did, he wanted, he had interest, but he only until he tapped that booty. Now that he tapped it, his interest, his curiosity is satisfied and he's ready to move on. So see, this is the thing. This is what's important for you young ladies to, to learn. When Some men are very petty. Okay, so you turned him down at first. So he got mad. So he was kept pressing, pressing, pressing until you gave in. So now he's going to get you back for rejecting him all those times. That's what's going on here. So I'm going to tell you this. This is, this is the way that you, the practice that you need to keep. If you weren't interested in a man at first, you never you stay disinterested forever. Okay, don't even go there because this is always the end result. They've been mad because you rejected them before so many times. So he's like, well, now it's going to be my turn to reject her. That's what's happening. It's silly, but it happens over and over and over and over and over. And over. That's just how men operate. Okay, so if you don't like him in the beginning, don't like him in the end either. Don't ever do what you just did. You know, then I gave him a chance. Fuck a chance. You ain't the EEOC. What the hell is this? Oh, my God. Let's move on to question number 19. Female, 22 to 27 years old from St. Louis, Missouri. Summary of issue. There are so many people who are always too busy on dating apps. I'm so tired of dating apps where I match with someone and we talk for a couple of weeks. And then in parentheses, if we even make it this far, close paren. When we go on a date, they always follow up by saying that they had a nice time, but they're too busy to date. I've had three guys tell me that they're not ready for a relationship, but after we've been talking for weeks, am I the problem? It just seems like nobody on dating apps is actually there to date or at least aren't looking to date people. I'm busy too. I have school, work, and I have friends and family obligations, and yet I still find time to go on dates or simply respond to people's messages. I'm so tired of people on dating apps not really ready to date. Maybe don't be on an app for dating if you don't want to Want, don't want or can't date people. No, the problem here is you because you have this mistaken belief that because it says dating app, that is really about a relationship. Dating apps are for booty. 
Okay, the more you young girls get that clue and understand dating apps, and the men are there mainly for to get some a good time on a mattress. That's what they're there for. They're, so they want to roll in and roll out. And it's not about trying to form a bond with you or be emotionally involved and connected with you and support you and be in love with you and all this kind of stuff. It's not about that at all. It's about how can they most expeditiously get their Johnson wet. That's what they're trying to figure out. That's all they're there for. So y'all stop going on these things with these fairy tale expectations of happily ever after. Those motherfuckers not trying to be happily ever after with you. It's, it's, it's unrealistic. The thoughts that you have about this whole process is, is kind of bizarre. I mean, why would somebody go do that if they could spend the time in the real world meeting people, be out socializing in the real world? Why would you be alone in the corner in the dark at some place swiping left and swiping right trying to find love? Think about this realistically, ladies. Come on now. They're going by what you look like on those things. Do they get a tingle down below when they look at you? And that's all that's the only reason that they're reaching out to you. Okay. Stop putting so much on it. Well, you thinking it means something romantic is going to be jumping off. It's not that kind of party on a dating app, okay? Any online dating, really, but those apps are even worse than what used to be the online dating. It's like a bunch of losers. And all, you know, the dudes, you got these dudes, I mean, they so into like popcorn and stuff, and then they get on those dating apps, and even if you do get a, quote, relationship going with them, they're weird. Yeah, as you see, they don't communicate well. They have problems. They can't, they, you know, are too into their, their videos and stuff, and they don't really know how to do anything like of a sensual, pleasurable nature to a woman. They just do stuff that they emulate from what they saw in those movies. And that's not real life. That's not how a woman's body should be treated. Those are paid actors. And that's the part that they don't seem to understand. They think the shit is real. And that those moans and groans that they hear in our, you know, that they, they're really pleasure. Those are scripts, fools. Okay, it's just you could just be watching the Flintstones or some shit. That's about how realistic it is. But here they go trying to take it out into the real world. I mean, even if they meet on the apps and they get married, it's stupid because you know how many letters do we get from these women who are married and they, they, that's how they met these men, and the, the marriage is all fucked up because the people are all fucked up. Only a certain kind of man is going to be trying to find a woman on a dating app. He can't be serious. Think about it. Yes, popcorn. That's what we call it. That's our, um, well, you capitalize the P and the O, and then you capitalize the R and the N, and there's your word. But it's popcorn on this channel. Okay, that's what we call it. Okay, uh, let's see. Oh, that's the one I just read. She wants to find love and she's looking online. Poor little thing. Question number 20. This is a female in the 22, 23, 22 to 27 age group from Durham, North Carolina. The male is in the 28 to 34 age group. Term issue. How can I get over things that my partner has told me? Maybe you shouldn't. Let's see what's going on here. So I'm basically struggling to understand a few things my partner has told me about himself lately. I'm really trying to get over them, but I can't help but feel super uncomfortable. I need some womanly advice. Basically, my partner told me that when he was 19 and a V, that he had an FWB relationship with a 39 to 40 year old woman at work. When he decided to end it, she then got he then got recommended by the woman he had the FWB with to start talking to her daughter, which he did. He told me that he had her too, end quote. But then he took this back. <laughs> so he's letting you know how trifling he was. Okay. This made me uncomfortable and I want to ask questions about it, even though it isn't my business. But he was the one to tell me, but he doesn't want to answer. He's told me things such as he's had a threesome, over 50 plus partners, which is apparently normal from his country. And that he's also made out with someone who was 16 when he was 28. Apparently he didn't know her age and stopped when he found out. I'm confused on how I feel. He treats me so well, 
He was supposed to be moving to another country last year, but stayed for me, apparently. He cooks for me, buys me gifts, and clearly loves me. I love spending time with him, but I cannot seem to be 100% fall for him yet. We have been together almost a year. I cannot seem to move past the things he has told me because he seemed super proud when he told me them, but then changed his mind when I pulled a face as a reaction to them. I don't know if this is just me being super shy and weird and awkward about things or if I should feel weird about them. Anyone in the squad got advice for me to move past this feeling? And how can I talk to them about them? Thanks in advance. See, this is why I tell people to shut up about your past. This is some shit he never should have told you. It's none of your business. And you did not need to know. It wasn't going to impact. See, my thing is you tell things that are going to impact your relationship in the present. All this past history with these other people and stuff have no bearing on your relationship in the here and now. He should never have told you that stuff. And that's what I would tell him. It's like, you know, you why did you tell me that stuff? What, what was the point of that? What was your goal there? Now, you did say he seemed really proud of it at first. Like, you know, he's like such a player player. He got around. He had all these experiences. Like he expects you to be like in awe, like, oh, wow, you, know, you screwed so many women. Oh, my God, Hercules, Hercules. Is that what he was looking for? I would sure be asking him because it's his reaction, you know, you, you know saying he seems proud. And then he didn't, he changed his mind when he saw you pull a face. It makes me wonder. I think that's what he was looking for, for you to be impressed. And then you were, you were disgusted instead. And so now he's like confused. And that's why he don't want to talk about it in detail anymore. If you hadn't pulled a face, he would have told you even more dirt. But this is my thing. You have to consider if you, because even though that is his past, um, you have to consider the kind of person that would do those kinds of things and if that's in line with your moral stance or not. Because for now that he's told you, it's going to stay in your mind forever. All right? This tag is like scratching my neck. Sorry. Um, it's going to stay in your mind forever and um, you're going to always be judging him. Is that going to make a good relationship? Nope. So you have a decision to make. Either you accept him for who and what he is and all these crazy stuff he's done or you deuce out and find you a man who's lived a more, you know, respectable kind of existence. Because going from the mother to, okay, the mother is trifling. You're just going to Screw somebody and pass them to your daughter so he can screw her too. I mean, who does that? Except somebody who's just disgusting. So these were the kind of people he was associating with. And then he, you know, not, not only did he, like, did she, did she suggest it, but he did it. So he, that makes him disgusting too. And all these things that he did, I mean, he should have never told you about his threesomes and all this old stuff here. That was just irrelevant. That's his life, his secret, his whatever. He should have told his diary or something, but he should never have told you. This is just insane. I don't understand. Yeah, see, but see, DJ, that's because you know you know what to do. You've been properly trained but on the Depsterism channel. You don't never show, show emotion. You just change, keep your face straight and let them talk. Then you cut, you ask them. <laughs> let them get it all out first. Just be like, really? Wow. Well, what did you think? Well, how'd that happen? Well, what did you think when she said to do that? What was going through your mind? Really? What did the daughter do? What did the daughter say? Oh, how long did this happen? How long was this going on? Really? Wow. Just ask a whole bunch of questions like you were interviewing like Barbara Walters used to do people. And then at the end I say, you know what? You a nasty ass motherfucker. I'm done here, sir. <laughs> Boop. Let's move on to question number 21. This is a male in the 20 to 34 age group from Washington, D.C. Sarah issue, I want to change. I'm so disappointed in myself. Wow. It hurts to admit that I've been a horrible person when it comes to relationships. I've lied to women about how I felt about them just so I could get the validation of them liking me back or for nook nook. The older I get, I'm realizing that this isn't who I want to be, but I don't know how to change. Why can I not be clear about my intentions? How can I make it clear that I just want nook nook and not lie my way around it and hurt people? I realize this sounds simple to fix, but am I broken? Any advice would be helpful. Thank you. I'm going to tell you this. You're going to reap what you sow. And what's going to happen 
at some point in your life, you're going to fall in love and you're going to want to be with somebody and she's going to just want you for look, look, and she's going to lie to you and she's going to break your heart and it's going to be your karma. So you won't be able to say shit because you got it coming. You got it coming home, skillet. It's going to come and there's nothing you can do about it. It's just a matter of when. Now, this thing about, you know, now you can't be clear about your intention. Yes, you can. But what you don't, you don't want to do it because you're afraid of rejection. You're scary. That's why you lie. You're not a real player because real players don't lie. They tell the truth. It's like, oh, you know, I'm just a bachelor. I'm just trying to, you know, I'm just getting around. I'm not trying to be like, I'm a rolling stone. I'm like a cumbleweed. I'm just going here and there, this and that, blah, blah, blah. If you have to lie, that means you're weak. Your game is weak. And you just, I'm telling you, I saw, okay, I saw this person. Okay. I used to go to Jeffrey's Inner Circle in Oakland all the time. That was like my, my haunt. And so I'm leaning up against the post one time and this brother, this, you know, this girl came and she was cute. You know, she was standing a few feet away from me. And so this brother walks in, he was cute. I mean, like, ooh, tall, dark, handsome, all of that. And he walked over to her and he's like, hi, what's your, you know, my name is so-and-so, what's yours? And so they sit there and, you know, chit-chatted for a little bit. He asked her if she wanted a drink. He bought a drink. They sit there. Talk. So maybe 30 minutes went by. And he's like, uh, she's like, well, you know, what, um, you know, so what, what are you going to do? You know, what brings you out here tonight anyway? You know, because he wasn't dancing or anything, you know. And he says, oh, I'm just here to try to get laid. You know, my head whipped. like <laughs> My head whipped around. And I was like, what? He said that? And she looked, you know, she kind of looked flustered. But she had been talking to him for 30. And like I said, dude was built and he was cute in the face and a nice body and stuff. And he's looking, he looked at her and he said, is that something that you would be interested in? And she said, yes. So he grabbed her hand and they left. Now, that was the smoothest shit I've ever seen in my life. Okay. But he had the looks and the height and the body build to carry it, to take, you know, to carry it off. Because if he had asked me, I probably would have went with him too. I'm like, shit, wait a minute. I was in, standing in the wrong spot. Yeah, but girl, I'm telling you, that shit was smooth. That was smooth as hell. The way he said it and that deep, sexy voice. I'm just here trying to get laid. Like, you know, like it's just a matter of fact thing. Like he wasn't even looking at it when he said he was looking at the dance floor. And, you know, but she, you know, she's standing right there. So, and I'm standing over there ear hustling. So I heard it. So see, to me, that's, and the other kind of players are the ones that, you know, puts the situation in. So the woman jumps his bones. She gets so hot and bothered. She's all over him. So you just a little chump. That's what you are. So, but I'm glad you recognize that your, your, your game is weak. So, you know, you just tell women, just like, you know, I'm really not trying to be in a relationship. I just, you know, I'm maybe a FWB or something like that. That's all you have to say. There are a lot of women that'll be down with that because they're trying to go to school and you know, work or whatever. And they just want a little relief every now and then. And as long as you deliver the goods, they'd be fine with that. So you just have to, you know, be yourself, be authentic, have a sense of integrity when you deal with other people. And then things will line up the way that you want them to. And you won't ever have to lie to a woman again because that's manipulative and it's wrong and it's, it's cowardly. Just, you know, take the hit. If you're going to get rejected, just take the sheet. Like, oh, I don't want an FWB. And you're like, okay. Well, it was nice talking to you. And then you move on to the next one. Because if you keep trying, you're going to find somebody who's going to say yes. Okay? That's just the way it is. Question number 22. Female, 18 to 21. From Santa Ana, California. Summary of issue. How do I tell my two girlfriends I hate the seven guys in our friend group? For context, I'm in the university at a predominantly male program as a result. I'm in a friend group that is also predominantly male. There are only two other girls in the group, and the way I'm treated compared to them is honestly jarring. Why do people have friend groups? What is that? I keep hearing that term that's driving me crazy. I think it's a big, big old gang of folks. Almost everything I say, any joke I make, is attacked by the guys, and not in a fun, teasing sort of way either. But my girlfriends make a joke, and they suddenly understand what irony is. The few times I have gone out with them to parties, I've walked back to my apartment alone while they walked the other two girls in our friend group home. There are literally eight of them. The only people that celebrated my birthday with me was my girlfriend, but for their birthday, all the guys made sure that, that there's an entire itinerary ready. I'm aware that this all sounds like they just don't like me, which may be true. 
it's just frustrating sometimes because I haven't done anything. There are a few of the guys in the group who I'm really close to individually, but as a whole, it's just sucky to be around. I feel like I'm walking on eggshells and annoying them with my presence. My girlfriends do not see it. They beg me all the time to come out with them and be there when this group hangs out, largely because they feel a bit uncomfortable being the only girls in a group full of guys. Also, they both have boyfriends that have told them that they'd feel better if I hung out with the group more. And I'm not stupid. I can clearly see it's because the guys aren't attracted to me. I don't date any different. I don't act rather any different than my girlfriends, but everything I do annoys them and everything they do is fun. But I really don't know how to explain that without sounding bitter and mad. As of now, I've just avoided being around them as much as possible, but it's getting really annoying having to fight with my girlfriends every Oh, stick page sticking together every weekend to not go out and honestly don't think a lot of them are good people in general. Am I just bitter? Should I even say anything? I've tried subtly bringing it up and they just laugh it off. I just know I, I don't know what to do and I'm just kind of tired. You just don't go out, stick to your guns and say, I will go out with you too, but I'm not going to go out anymore with the big group. And secondly, why are they, if they have boyfriends, why do they keep hanging around with these, all these just go gang of dudes all the time? What kind of shit is that? If that was my girlfriend, I'd be like, oh, hell no, you're not going. You're not going. You might go once after school or some shit or just to go out on the weekend. That's my time. You be spending with the motherfuckers all the time. No, we're not doing that. I would have a problem if, if it was my girlfriend. I would have a problem with that frequency. So, um, yeah, just tell, just, you're going to have to just tell, like, look, you know, just what I said. I will go out with you two. I will never again attend any event where all of those guys are there. That is my final word. That's my boundary. Don't ask me anymore. Because if you keep asking me, that means you're not respecting my no. And that means I'll have to cut you next. So leave me alone. We, we can still associate. But these are the parameters under which we will do that. And if at any time you try to pull a fast one where you think, well, I'm going to get her out. And then I'm going to invite those guys. I will get up and leave. And then I will never speak to you again. That's what will happen. So I'm telling you now, you better respect my no. This is my boundary. This is my bottom line. I'm not going to be around them chumps. It's not going to happen. That's what you need to tell them. And I don't understand why you're so hesitant about it. Trying to torture, let yourself be tortured to be around a bunch of cretins. Question number 23. This is a female in the 22 to 27 age group from Plano, Texas. Summary of issue. Dating is so draining mentally. <laughs> yeah, we hear this all the time. I am sick of meeting nice men and getting my hopes up only to end up crying over them. Really? It's so exhausting mentally and physically. I want love and a family, and it just seems it'll never happen for me. I don't know if I'm ugly or something, but the toll is too hard on me. And I know people are going to say, you're young. You still have plenty of time. I don't want to be sad and single till I'm 40 and even 30 years old. I'm 22, and I have never been in love, and I'm tired. Girl, you don't know how lucky you are. You know what? The fact that you never lived in love, that means you never had a breakup and a heartbreak. Be happy at 22. You've, you've, you've dodged a bullet. Young men in your age group are stupid. Okay? The, the heartbreak is just bound to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's when it's going to happen. They cheat. They lie. They don't know how to talk to you. They talk, they're crazy. They're violent. They have, you know, criminalistic behaviors. They're druggies. They're just stupid, you know, video game addicts, popcorn addicts. They have all kinds of problems. And you sitting up there bad at yourself and beating yourself up because None of them little clowns want to pay attention to you. You should be thanking the Lord Jesus Christ himself for that, that they're not interested in you. Look at all the drama that comes through this column from these girls that have these kind of these relationships with these knuckleheads. They ain't about shit. You ain't miss nothing. Yeah, 22, and she up there crying like she's 90 and never had love in her life, and she just, she just became an adult last week. These girls be tripping. Question number 24. We're almost at the end of this torture. <laughs> Female, 28 to 34 from Henderson, Nevada. Some of the issue. My friend ended our friendship last year in December and just sent me a text after no contact. In the summer of 2023, I met a new friend on Bumble BFF. Oh, there's such a thing? She was from my area and we con connected instantly. We're both 30 years old. We hung out once a week during the summertime and spend a lot of time sharing about each other's trauma. She is very for the people and woke, is how people would call it. I'm obviously for the people, though, but I don't constantly post about these things on social media. One day last year in December, totally out of the blue, she texted me saying that 
We should end our friendship because we have different outlooks on life, different views on things, etc. I asked her twice if she would explain more as I'm willing to talk things out. For so long, I thought I was the problem, but I couldn't remember being rude to her or saying anything out of line. So I'm not like that. All I know is during that time where she, quote, broke up with me was when I recently got into a new relationship. And when she was going on this spiral, looking through so many posts about the issues going on in Palestine and Israel. I'm not sure if she got jealous that I had a relationship or except that I never shared anything about the war on my social media. I asked her to explain, but she would just say we have different outlooks on life, et cetera, et cetera. Never really giving me a real explanation. So I just didn't respond and moved on. Anyway, I'm the type of woman that likes being spoiled by my man and likes to spoil him too. And I remember anytime I would tell her anything about what my new boyfriend did, she always took it in a weird way, saying things like how she doesn't celebrate Valentine's Day, doesn't like when he buys things, doesn't like when he tries to do things for her that she can easily do for herself. This honestly put a downer on things, but I wouldn't end her friendship over it just because we have different outlooks. So aside from that, she reached out to me yesterday out of the blue after no contact since December. She apologized and said it must have it must have felt so shitty for her to randomly end things and that she feels like she didn't handle it well. She said depression makes it hard for her to handle friendships. I haven't responded yet, but I genuinely believe she did handle it badly. I cried about her for weeks. I thought it was all my fault and that I said or did something wrong. I'm not sure I want her back in my life. I'm worried she would do the same thing. My trust in her is completely broken now. What should I do? What would you do in this situation? I would like, but see, she would have never been able to text me because like I said, when I break up with people, it don't matter, male, female, it could be a family member, job related, whatever. When I'm done with you, you're blocked. You, you ain't texting me nothing. You're not going to email me. You're not going to be on my social media. And you're not going to call me because you're blocked. Now, that's the mistake you made. You didn't block her. So that's how she's able to come and weasel her way right back into your life. Y'all kill me with this. Don't, am I the only one that uses the block feature? Am I the only one on this planet? Because it's like these girls all write in every week. It's the same thing. They have people who did them dirty and they don't block the person. And they let the person come back into their life to fuck with their head some more. I don't understand that. You ain't get, talking to me as a privilege that you are being hereby denied forevermore. You can't do that. Okay, so it's two of us, Maya and Deborah. <laughs> Use block. And Ash. Okay, so three of us. It's just unbelievable to me how many women don't use it. So um, in a situation like this, so she said that, you know, depression makes it hard to handle friendships. I would highlight that and send it back to her and say, this is why we will not ever be friends again. I don't trust you and you need to work with, worry about your depression. And then when you send that and you see that she's read it, then you block her. So she can't respond anymore. Okay. Block. Use the block feature. And our final question for tonight. Oh my God. Yeah, honey, block, I'm telling you, my, my block list on Facebook is like thousands of people because I used to be on there a lot, you know, at first I used to spend a lot of time on there, you know, and posting stuff and having a form, running my forms and pages and stuff over there. And then, so, you know, you run, my, you know, my opinions, I'm opinionated, especially about relationships and how men should and should not act. Well, you know, the brother team did not like that and they was coming for me hard. And uh, so every time somebody says something I didn't like or use some kind of slur or anything like that, block, 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 block. So it's thousands of men, but mostly men and some women too. Well, the women's screen names, I don't know if they're really women, um, on my block list on Facebook. So now when I go over there, it's so peaceful that I don't really spend that much time there. But yes, let us move on to question number 25 of our last question of the night. And if you are not a subscriber to this channel, please hit that subscription button and the instant notification bell so you can get an update when we do do some live streams because the date moves around. <laughs> no matter when I schedule it, it's going to move. You can pretty much guarantee it. So you're going to keep up with what's going on and where you can find the show. You better become a subscriber. Otherwise, you're going to miss it. Question number 25. This is a man in the 28 to 34 age group from Los Angeles, California. Some of issue. My date walked out on me. And he says, Deb, you ain't going to believe this shit. So I invited a woman out for drinks. <laughs> she seemed nice. 
We were going to go to one place, but I had to switch to another as the first place was too busy to take a reservation. We ordered drinks. We were conversing. Then she kept saying things and erupting in laughter. I'm more even keeled. She was goofy, but I just don't crack up every time someone makes a joke. Anyways, it seemed kind of awkward, so I asked her how she's feeling after like 30 minutes. She immediately gets up and says she's done wasting time and wishes me luck. She says <laughs> she said she'll Venmo me. I didn't get her number, so no, she wasn't. I told her to wait. Like, God damn, how are you going to just get up and leave? Jesus, LOL. Psycho behavior. She's like, you want me to pay? I'm just in shock, LOL. So she leaves me and sits at the bar to pay the bill. I'm sitting at the table like, I don't know what to do, LOL. I'm not going to just sit there. <laughs> this poor guy. I'm just going to sit there. So I go to the hostess and let her know I'm leaving because my date ditched me. She says she's paying the bill. So I point at her sitting at the bar so they know she was paying and I dip. The hostess apologized that I got left, LOL. I explained it's no big deal because it's not. But this is the second time out of maybe 50 dates that someone has just walked out on me. Damn, dude, for real? All I did was have a normal conversation and try to get to know her, LOL. I know this is just dating and you're going to tell me not to take it too seriously. But damn, why do you think she did that? I was just wondering that why she did that. You guys have any thoughts on why she did that? I think it's connected to her nervous um, laughter and attempts at making jokes and stuff. You said that you're more of an even keel person. And so you probably were just sitting there with your straight face while she was laughing by herself. That made her feel awkward and that you didn't find her funny or interesting at all. And that's why she said it felt like she was wasting her time. So, you know, you could have faked a laugh or you could have told a joke that was you thought was funny. Then both of you could have laughed. You could have saved this. But no, you're just going to sit there with your mean mug on and, and look your judgy face. And so she felt she got turned off. I think that's what it was. The way that you mentioned that, you know, how she kept doing it and she was goofy. She could see that you're not. And so she probably felt like her, you know, your personalities didn't really mesh. She was looking for somebody. She wanted the date to be fun. You know, laugh, joking around, that kind of stuff. And you and see you sitting up there with, like I said, your judgy face on and just, you know, looking for stuff to be all serious and mature and whatnot. So you always, you know, have two different goals for the date and it just didn't match. It didn't work. That's what ha I think happened. Of course, that's just judging by what you said, you know, because I we, I don't have her side of the story. But the way that you describe things, that's the that's assessment that I can come up with from what you what you shared. Because I'm thinking if I was cracking jokes and stuff and the person just sitting right there, little mean mug, looking at me like, you know, not saying anything, not laughing or anything. I, I'd feel some kind of way about it. But knowing me, my, with my mouth, like, what, you can't get a joke? You don't know how to laugh. What's wrong? Your face, it, like, born like that? You can't laugh or smile or nothing? What's wrong with you? And then, you know, you would have got, you probably would have got offended or said, said no no it's not that at all but at least it would have broke the ice but that's how i'm just very direct like that i remember when i was working i had this conflict with this dude at work right he got on my nerves and i told him about himself so he was in his you know in his feelings you know what i mean i'm like okay i done told you about the problem now i'm done with that let's move on i don't hold grudges like that unless i need revenge then i do like i build a shrine and worship daily at that motherfucker but this was you know, some little bullshit shit at work. You know, he, he didn't hurt me. It was just something he did that got on my nerves. So I told him about it. And I said, don't do that shit again. But he got all, you know, huffy and puffy. And so a couple of weeks later, you know, he was like avoiding me in the halls and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, what? he would just act like a little bitch. So I went in his office and closed the door. I said, we need to talk. He says, oh, no. I said, yeah, yeah, we're going to talk. And you're going to talk to me from just from you're going to talk to me every day now. Because this, this whatever this is you're doing right here. This is just unacceptable. You always laughed and joked with me before, and then just because you did something wrong and you got told about yourself, now you want to pout? You being all sulky? I, I don't do sulky. So you better talk to me. So then he's laughed, and then it was fine. He took me out to lunch a bunch of different times for my birthdays and stuff. He was cool. But, you know, I had to break that ice. I'm just like, we, we're not doing that. I don't, I don't do that icy thing. I'm not talking to you thing. I don't do that. You're going to talk to me, <laughs> whether you want to or not. That's what's, that's what's going to happen. So anyway, we have another holiday on Monday. 
Next Saturday is our eight-hour live stream. Is it next Saturday? When is it? The end of the month. I don't know. Anyway, check the web page. I don't know what the date is today. Let me not say that because it might not be next Saturday. It might be the Saturday after that. But whatever it is, anyway, it's coming up. We're going to do an eight-hour live stream here, and we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. I couldn't find any guests, so I guess we're not going to have any guests, and you guys didn't make any suggestions either. So it's just going to be me unless somebody, you know, responds over the next week or so. And uh, we're just going to talk about all kinds of stuff. And we can do some call-in, you know, the $10 advice uh, questions. And then, uh, you know, I'll talk about some various topics that are hot in the news. And you can bring up some stuff that you want to talk about. And, and the phone lines will be open. So you'll be able to call in and talk and share your stories and your thoughts, uh, you know, on the audio. All right. You don't have to show your face. I have that blocked off. So we don't want you showing your face and getting in trouble. You just call you just be calling in all with the audio only. Okay. But we'll see you then very soon. Right next Saturday for sure. Whether it's the like the real, the big live stream or whether it's just another show like this. I don't know. I don't recall. Completing the fifth. I'll see you guys later. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.